Hello everybody! Welcome back to The Cooking Show. Welcome back to The Cooking Stream. If you're currently watching this live, it is Wednesday, July 17th, 5 p.m. EDT, and it is lovely to have all of you with me today. Hope you're all having a lovely Wednesday. Hope you're all, you know, just chilling and hanging out. Um, it's been a few days since we last stream on Sunday. And so, we're gonna be back. I have a lovely little dish coming up ahead of us today, which I'm really, really excited about that I haven't had the chance to do or eat or talk about in a while. And there's gonna be a lot of theory, there's gonna be a lot of concepts. It's not gonna necessarily be the most simple dish, but it's all gonna work out and it's all gonna be nice and delicious at the end of the day. Hello to all of my lovely little sous chefs. Hello to Ilium, hello to Ark, hello to Moonham, hello to Kelly Loon, hello to Dosky, hello to Trashcan Cat Mom. It is excellent to have all of you with me today. And everybody, welcome on in. It is good to have all of you. So, what are we doing today? We're going to be doing a little beef stroganoff. We'll talk about some of the origins of beef stroganoff. We'll talk about all the different ways that I think people have taken this concept and have really misappropriated it and have done a lot of things to it that I don't feel like it should. And then we'll talk about all the different techniques that are going into it. So, first and foremost, what even is a stroganoff? A stroganoff is essentially a steak, specifically a steak, and I'll get more to that in just a second. Traditionally done with a tenderloin, but I don't have tenderloin money. And it is inside of a mushroom cream sauce, a sour cream sauce with some onions, as well as uh, served with like some noodles. Either some rice or some pasta, depending on your preference. Now. Everybody, this is one of those dishes that I see people do and they talk about over and over again. And people have very little understanding of the technique and the concepts that go into it. They don't cook the meat right, they uh, add mushrooms in at a weird step, they don't develop proper browning, they don't build their sauce correctly, and they don't finish it correctly with the sour cream. The point of this dish is to be able to get specifically a cut of steak. So this isn't really a braise per se, this is not like chuck, this is not short ribs, this has to specifically be a steak. Um, any cut of meat that would be good serving medium rare. And then the mushrooms would need to be nice and perfectly cooked. And sour cream, not heavy cream, but sour cream would be going into the sauce. Um, also, Goth Moth 482, welcome on in. It is lovely to have you. So let's do a little walkthrough of all of our, di uh, all of our different ingredients for today. And we're going to start off with a nice big piece of beef, my friends. Now, I have here a flat iron steak. Flat irons are not necessarily known for being the most tender, but I'm going to walk you through exactly how to cook this, exactly how to prepare this, so that it is nice and tender. Traditionally, a restaurant beef stroganoff, it's not really a home dish. It is a restaurant dish that uses beef tenderloins. Okay, you would have tenderloins, you'd chop them up into little cubes, and then you'd really quickly cook them. I have a flat iron, I'm gonna walk you through how to still get this piece of meat nice and tender. This would theoretically work with any steak cut. I would prefer something a little bit leaner. Flat irons, they do tends to be quite lean, although this end does have quite a bit of intramuscular fat, which I'm not complaining about. You can use skirt steak, you can use tenderloins, you can use ribeyes, you can use New York strips, but I'm using a flat iron because as opposed to a ribeye, this was $7 a pound and not $18 a pound. So the cost efficacy of this, the cost effectiveness is super, super important. Okay, so I have a little flat iron steak. And that's right, Ali, it's on a sheet tray with a wire rack. Super important. Next, everybody, I have some white button mushrooms that I have thoroughly, thoroughly washed. I've washed them off, I've soaked them in some water. We'll talk about why you can soak them in water. We'll talk about the cleaning through mushrooms and all the different misconceptions. So we have some white butter mushrooms, but feel free to be creative with your mushroom choices. You can do shiitakes, you can do morels, you can do basically any mushroom that you have available to, but the classic white button mushroom is what I'm going to be using for today, my friends. Okay, next, let's talk about some of the other produce for today. Um, I have an onion, I have a red onion, which will be used as a topping. I have some lovely sprigs of thyme, and then I also have some garlic cloves for the pungency, for the aliminess, and this is really going to give a dish a lot of flavor today. Gonna go ahead and set that down. Let's talk about some of the different sauce components. So. We want a lot of meaty sauces going into this today. We're gonna have a little bit of tamari or soy sauce. It's not gonna be enough that you explicitly taste it, but it's going to give it a little bit of oomph. Additionally, we also have some Worcestershire sauce, which is essentially a Western style fish sauce with a couple of spices inside of it. So Worcestershire sauce, as well as some tamari to give it a bit of a meaty kick. Uh, next, what do I have behind me? One of the most important ingredients for today, my friends, sour cream. 
I'm gonna walk you through exactly the step and the stage that you need to be adding to sour cream. People mess up adding the sour cream to the beef stroganoff and then it comes all split in little curdles. My sour cream is not gonna split. I had leftover sour cream inside my fridge and that was my inspiration for it today. I saw the sour cream, I got inspired, I wanted to do a stroganoff. Okay, um, next, I have some egg noodles. You can do any kind of pasta that you would like. It doesn't have to be an egg noodle. We're just gonna cook it, we're gonna boil it, and then we're gonna serve it with some butter, and it's gonna be nice and delicious. It's gonna be an egg noodle. It'll be nothing to complain about. We just want something bland to be able to soak up and to be able to be coated in all of that delicious sauce. Okay, next, everybody, I have some white wine, and I also have some powdered chicken stock because I did not get to making a batch of chicken stock lately. Powdered is totally fine and some white wine will be the base of the sauce for today. It's gonna to make it nice and acidic, it's gonna make it nice and sweet. It's going to add in a lot of wonderful flavor today. So, that is the basic gist of all the different ingredients. We also have some mustard, which we'll be adding on in. Um, yeah, and then we'll begin. We'll be seasoning up our beef. We're gonna be salting it well ahead of time. We'll be salting it in advance. We'll be building the rest of the components. We'll be doing some onions to go alongside that, and it's gonna be lovely. So. That being said, is everybody ready for today? I wanna to hear a nice yes chef from everybody watching, please and thank you. I talked a little too fast. I'm a little short of breath. I need to get some water. Mm. <clears throat> okay, so everybody, if you have any questions at any point in time, please feel free to ask me. It can be about this dish. It can also be about anything else food related because remember, I am here to teach you how to be able to cook at home. Second of all, if you ever want a little update on some of the ingredients, you can always type in exclamation mark menu. And third of all, uh, everybody, if you would like to financially support the show, please check out my Patreon, exclamation mark Patreon. My goal is to be able to do this cooking show full time one day. And so any and all support on the Patreon would go a really long way. Okay, everybody, let's go ahead and begin with the stroganoff. Have my cutting board all set up and all ready to go. But right now, let's talk about the beef. So really, really important. You want to use cuts of beef that are suitable to be cooked as steaks. Beef tenderloin would be the most traditional. I don't have beef tenderloin money. I assume that you might not also have that on a weeknight. This is a flat iron steak. Uh, it's not too expensive at all, and it can still be nice and tender if we cut it accordingly. So everybody, I need you all to tap into this because this is going to be super, super important, and I have a very important message to say. Okay? so. A lot of people, for the stroganoff, they take their beef and they cut it into little strips. They cut it into little pieces. They put it on their pan that they say is hot enough and it does not get a crust. It instead releases all of its liquid, the beef immediately becomes dry and there is no meaningful caramelization developed. Everybody, the key to a really amazing stroganoff is to completely subvert tradition. We don't have a wok. We don't have super high heat output. If we were to slice this into thin little pieces, we will never develop a crust. If we slice this into thin little pieces, the meat is going to shrivel up immediately. It's gonna release all of its liquid. It's not gonna be juicy. It's not gonna be tender. It's gonna be dry and the flavor will not be developed. Everybody, the key to a really, really beautiful stroganoff or any stir fry dish that you're not doing, let's say the Chinese method of velvetic, okay, is to start from a whole steak. We want to get this into cubes, but we seal it whole. We cook the whole piece of meat, and then we slice it up into pieces, and then we put it back into the sauce. That way, we get to develop a beautiful crust on it, okay, without necessarily compromising uh, the, the integrity of it. So, Everybody, one big beautiful flat iron steak. I have no idea how much it weighs, maybe like a pound and a half or so. So it is on a sheet tray. I let this air dry in my fridge overnight. Why do we let it air dry? It gets rid of some of the surface moisture and it's able to brown better on the pan. Next, we're going to be seasoning this really, really generously, my friends, with a bunch of kosher salt right on top. And then we're going to go ahead and let it sit. I need to hear another yes chef from everybody watching, please and thank you. There is a huge misconception that still goes around with steaks that people on food YouTube have pioneered and pushed and they've said over and over again in the last 10 years, which is, oh, only season your steaks just before you cook it. Otherwise, it pulls out the moisture and makes it dry. It is absolute and complete nonsense. Everybody, by salting it in advance, we effectively dry brine the steak. The salt is able to penetrate because it is 
water soluble. The whole thing gets nice and evenly seasoned instead of just on the outside. And then it actually increases the moisture retention. Dry brining any piece of protein makes it juicier. So do not listen to any of the people that say, oh, salting a piece of meat in advance makes it dry. Absolute nonsense. They do not know what they're talking about. They're only saying that because somebody they listened to said that once and they never bothered to question it. I'm going to go ahead, flip it over on its side, and we're going to go ahead and get the whole thing nice and thoroughly seasoned. Everybody, season from nice and up high. Because if you season really, really close, your splash radius is not going to be as big as it could be. Seasoning it up from high, allows it to evenly cover the piece of meat. Okay, so nice and up high. It's a thick steak. We want a lot of salt on there. This looks like it's a lot of salt, but I promise you, my friends, this is a lot of protein that needs to get seasoned. So be incredibly, incredibly generous with this process. A little bit more. And then we're just gonna put this in our fridge and let it sit until we're ready to use it. Ideally, you would do this about two hours in advance. Given the timeline of today, I think it's only going to be uh, maybe like 30 minutes or so. So, I'm still Allie asks, I usually salt and then leave in the fridge on a wire rack sheet pan for a day or so, is that not correct? Nope, that's perfect. For a day or so, it's going to uh, penetrate properly, it's going to do exactly what you need it to. So, it'll work out just fine by the sounds of it, okay? So, I think that's a nicely and evenly seasoned piece of meat, my friends. All that I'm gonna go ahead and do is forget about it until we're ready to cook with it. Ideally, once again, you would do this two hours in advance because that does allow the surface to dry out and for it to build up a really nice crust. But in the meantime, we salted in advance. All I'm gonna go ahead and do now is just throw this into my fridge. So, give me one little moment. All that we did, my friends, is we salted the beef. We're using a flat iron steak. Again, you want to use steak cuts. And we'll talk about why certain cuts of meat are optimal for steaks and why certain cuts of meat are not so good for steaks. So, into the fridge this goes. So, everybody, you might be asking me, why are certain cuts of meat better suited to be cooked as a steak, whereas others are more associated with stewing and long roasting? So, this has to do with a couple of things. First of all, for a cut to be a steak cut, you generally want as little connective tissue and sinew inside of the meat as possible. Think of a cut of meat like chuck. Think of a cut of meat like beef shoulder. You have a lot of connective tissue running through it. That connective tissue is super, super tough if you were to cook it like a steak. If you cook it long and low and slow, all of that collagen breaks down into gelatin and the meat becomes really, really nice and soft. But if you're cooking it like a steak, meaning somewhere below 140 degrees, that piece of meat will be super tough. Second thing that you're looking for on what is a steak cut is the grain of meat. Basically, your muscle fibers, let's say on my arm, they tend to flow in one direction. On something like a cut of chuck, the muscle fibers are going every single which way. For a really tender cut of meat, you want to cut perpendicular to the muscle fibers, and you essentially just want a grain of meat. You want a grain of meat following a direction. So something like a flat iron, something like a flank stick, something like a ribeye, they don't have a lot of connective tissue, the muscle fibers aren't too thick, and the muscle fibers, they tend to be flowing into one direction. Things like short ribs, things like chuck, things like eye of round, things like legs, they don't tend to have all of these qualities that I've described. So for today, again, everybody, use cuts of meat that are uh, specifically good as steaks. Okay, so... The beef has been salted. The beef has been sitting in the fridge now. Uh, let's go ahead and do some of the other ingredient prep for today. Okay, so back to the cutting board we go. So everybody, I had a lime in my fridge and I had a red onion in my fridge. And so I wanted a topping for this meat today. I wanted to have a topping uh, kind of like I would get in Turkish restaurants or in Uzbek restaurants where you would see like a pile of red onions on top of like a kebab or on, a, on top of like some meat. Okay, uh, now the flavors that we're going to be using are going to be a little bit all over the place, but that's okay. It'll be delicious. It'll all work out. The whole point of this is to use up the existing leftovers that I've had in my fridge. I have a leftover half a lime. I'm not going to go out of my way to buy a lemon just because it makes it more in the context of sumac onions. I have half a red onion leftover, so we're going to turn this into a really delicious topping for my beef today. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and set this stuff behind me. We're not gonna need that. 
Additionally, I have some sumac. Again, I'm really, really inspired by uh, like the Turkish red onions that you would get on top of a kebab. I'm really inspired by like the kind that you would get in like a little sandwich and like a little pita. And so we're gonna make some seasoned marinated sumac onions, my friends. So lime, sumac, red onion, and then also some parsley. So, neat waifu, you ask me, uh, you ask me, why do you use a red onion for this? Uh, is it preference or to avoid food waste? Really good question. So, there's a few different answers I can give you. First of all, avoiding food waste. I had half a red onion in my fridge and I wanted to use it up. Second of all, cultural context. In Turkish food, even if that's not what we're making today, in Middle Eastern food, um, typically red onions would be used for marinating because they're so pretty. Uh, red onions, they hold up well to marination, the colors leach out, and they get really, really beautiful. Okay, so functionally, you could use another type of onion, but in general, red onions, they tend to be traditional because they look the prettiest as a garnish. So, I hope that answers your question. Um, okay, so all that we're going to do, my friends, this is half a red onion. It's already been sliced in half, and all we're gonna do is just peel back that skin. Peel it back, get that skin out of here. No problem, neat waifu, I'm happy to help out. Get that skin out of here, and as always, everybody, when you cook at home, you want a little waste bowl ready to go. You want the little waste bowl, you wanna put all of your scraps in there because you don't wanna be going back and forth through to the trash can. So. Red onion, ready to go. Now, the next question is, what kind of slices do we actually want on the red onion? Um, so, if you cut it perpendicular to the grain of the onion, the grain of the cells sort of flow this way, um, you know, it tends to be a little bit more pungent, it tends to be a little bit more harsh, but it does look a little bit more beautiful that way. If you do cut it this way, um, because you're not rupturing as many cells, the onion doesn't tend to be as pungent. It doesn't really matter as much because it's gonna be marinated in some lime juice, it's gonna be marinated in some acid, so it's not gonna have that much oniony pungency. Also, with red onions, I gotta stop rubbing my hands because I'm getting all of the blood of the onion, all of the red onion juices all over me. Gonna go ahead and just quickly wash that off. So I'm gonna be cutting it parallel to the onion, but everybody, it doesn't really matter. The only thing is I'm just imagining a nice pile of sliced up, seasoned, marinated onions on top of my beef. So as long as we have that, then I'm gonna be all set. So I'm not looking for chops, I'm not looking for chunks. All I'm really looking for is just a nice little slice. So I'm gonna go ahead and put on some gloves for this to protect my dainty little eczema in hands. Okay. Go ahead and get that on my little paws. And all that we're going to do, everybody, is just slice this up nice and thin. I'm gonna cut off the butt of the onion, off it goes, and with a really, really nice sharp knife, my friends. If it's a sharp knife, you're not going to end up crying, okay? We're going to go in with not a paper-thin slice, but something a little bit thicker than a paper-thin slice. If you would like, you could also use a mandolin for this. That would be really, really good. Okay, so everybody, nice slices, don't chop it. If you chop it, it cleaves outwards and it doesn't give you an even slice. Come take a look. I'm gonna grab this knife. Um, well, not with onions really, but generally speaking, if you chop down vertically, it wants to push out. You wanna use as little vertical force as possible, my friends, and that is how you get nice, even slices. How many times have you wanted a thin slice of onion and take a look at what happens, ready? This happens, look, it popped out. The onion slid out. It became like a wedge of onion. It didn't come out evenly. Instead of a nice, beautiful slice like this, right? It just pops out, right? You can see it just tapers off. And the reason you're doing that, the reason that you're getting that is because you're not slicing, my friends. You need to slice it. You need to slice it. You need to use the full length of the knife with minimal vertical force. When you use the full length of the knife, I promise you, your knife will not pop out. You will not have those same issues as before. So nice and thin, my friends, nice and slowly. Get through it, get it all done, and we're going to get a lovely little pile of red onions, okay? Get through it, get it done. Get it done, get it done. And then anytime this feels like a little bit wobbly or unstable, all we do is we give it a little quarter turn because the other side tends to be more stable and we keep going. Slice it, slice it. Minimal vertical force, my friends. You don't wanna go all the way down. What you don't wanna hear is this. You don't wanna hear the knife always hitting the bottom of the cutting board. You wanna go from base to tip, base to tip, base to tip, all the way through. You see, too much vertical force and that one popped out. And that, my friends, is how you get perfect knife skills. 
So many people, they look at the videos of prep cooks going in and they're going in and they're processing onions like brrr, all the way through. But if you were to actually look at and inspect those slices, they kind of suck because they're not slicing, they're chopping. Everybody, slicing and chopping are two very different mechanisms. Put some respect onto slicing and you will obtain a bunch of beautiful, thinly sliced red onions. So I'm gonna go ahead and get that into a little vessel. I'm gonna get that into a little container. I'm going to have to go up on a step stool because I cannot normally reach it. And this is just going to go into a Tupperware that will then be destined for the fridge. So grab that. Let's grab a lid that is suitable for this bad boy. Someone eventually, please. These are my roommates, Tapua. I did not organize this. Uh, please tell me this works. Okay, lovely. I think that'll do just fine. Why was there a red flash? Uh, Bobco, I don't know. I think my webcam might just be freaking out a little bit. Was it my webcam specifically? Uh, okay, I don't understand chopping like brrr is a thing. Well, Shai Chica, sometimes it doesn't matter. Sometimes you don't need beautiful slices. But in the context of something like sumac onions, we want like nicely, beautifully marinated red onions. Uh, we do want to be like really, really pretty and delicate with this stuff. So everybody, grab your little bench scraper. It's your favorite tool to be able to just pick things off of the cutting board. Pick them up and add them into your container of choice. This is gonna sit in my fridge. This is just gonna marinate in there until we of course need it, okay? So, we got onions, nice and done. Everybody, one of my favorite kitchen tools, as always, is my little citrus press. I love my citrus press to death. It makes it so much easier than squeezing it by hand. Limes, limes tend to be hard. Limes, you need to use a lot of hand strength. I don't think anybody should be doing that. Get yourself a citrus press. This is one I really like. It's the Tabletop KitchenAid one. Grab it, flesh side down, not flesh side up. Flesh side down, everybody. Take it and give it a big old squeeze. Big old squeeze, big old squeeze. And get all of that lime juice inside. Traditionally, sumac onions would be made with lemon and not lime, but guess what? I did not have a lemon at home. I am not going to go out of my way to buy a lemon if I already have a lime. Everybody, the beauty of cooking is that ingredients can be interchangeable. Sure, it might not be authentic to a traditional sumac onion to use a lime, but guess what? Who cares? When you cook at home, your number one goal should be to always first use what you already have in your fridge. It'll be a little play on sumac onions if it uses lime instead of lemon. You could also play around with using different vinegars. As long as it's something acidic, it's going to accomplish the job of marinating the red onion, my friends. Okay, so let's get the rest of that juice out. Let's go ahead and discard this bad boy who is now prolapsed and throw him away. I'm gonna go ahead and quickly rinse this bad boy off and put that onto my drying rack because remember, the easiest time to clean is as you go, my friends. This doesn't need any soap. It was just some lime juice on there. Just gonna go ahead and rinse all that stuff off. Sorry for the analogy there. I should not have probably said that, actually. But I get one. I get one incredibly uncomfortable food analogy that makes everybody go, ugh, each time. Okay, I think I get one of those per stream, okay? Chef, if I bought a citrus press and it feels flimsy and barely fits a big lemon, do I return it or do all of them barely fit a lemon? The answer is get a bigger citrus press. You can absolutely return it and find a bigger one. The small ones are if you're only working with limes or small like my lemons, but if they're big boy lemons, I would recommend a bigger citrus press. Okay, so everybody, we got the lime juice inside. We have the onions inside. Let's talk about some of the other ingredients that are going to go in. Next, this is sumac. Sumac, I believe it is a dried part of a bush. If I'm not mistaken, it's very citrusy. It's very aromatic. It's super, super delicious. I love sumac and so should you. So all I'm going to go ahead and do is grab a little tiny spoon. And everybody, I'm not measuring how much lime I'm using, okay? Also, Tarina, enough, no more discussion of that word anymore in chat, please. So let's go ahead and get some sumac inside. Everybody, this is not like a spice per se. You could be quite generous with it. These are sumac marinated onions, so I'm looking for it to be nice and flavorful. So sumac goes in. I can go ahead and do away with Mr. Sumac now. Everybody, please say thank you to sumac in the chat. Please and thank you. Let's go ahead and get some salt. 
and the and so my inspiration for this again uh, there's a lot of overlaps and a lot of inspiration that you can take between uh, Russian food because beef stroganoff is a Russian dish and Turkish food specifically the thing that I feel like really links the two of them right now is going to be the parsley everybody parsley is everywhere in Russian food Russians love their parsley they love their petrushka uh, parsley is everywhere in Middle Eastern food Russian restaurants in New York serve so much Turkish food a lot of Russian cuisine is like Middle Eastern inspired combined with like French inspiration plus a little bastardization and then like uh, Cold War era rationing. That is what Russian cuisine is, okay? Sumac is part of the Kasher family? Well, there you go. I did not know that, uh, Trash Can Cat Mom, so thank you for telling us. So, I have some parsley. Um, and I will say, the quality of the parsley now has kind of gone down for me as opposed to how it used to be. The neighborhood I live in now is a lot more uh, Latino. Uh, and so, I have a lot more different options for cilantro here, but a lot of the parsley in the supermarkets is not as good. My previous neighborhood was very Turkish, it was very Russian, there was a lot of really good quality parsley. So it was a bit of a trade-off. You can see some of the leaves here are yellowing, but that's okay everybody, we'll make do. Because remember, country girls make do. I'm not a country girl, sorry. Okay, let's go ahead and get all of that parsley onto the cutting board, and this will be the parsley specifically used for the um, onions. The rest of it we'll be tackling later on because the parsley will be going into the stroganoff itself. Okay, so everybody, as always, how do I process my fresh herbs? First of all, you need to soak them. You do not want to just rinse them under a little bit of water. Cilantro and parsley are some of the biggest offenders for dirty herbs. They're covered in dirt, they're covered in sand. You do not want that in your food. It is not enough to simply wash them under some running water. You need to soak them, strain them, rinse them three times at bare minimum to get rid of all of the sand and the sediment. So, after I do so, I dry them off in my salad spinner, and the way that I keep it fresh in my fridge, everybody, as always, is a Tupperware plus paper towel. Tupperware plus paper towel, it'll last you such a long time, you'll keep your herbs nice and fresh. Don't keep it in a plastic bag, they will wilt. Don't keep them exposed, they will wilt. You want to put them into a Tupperware plus paper towel. Can we drain them? Well, that's part of the cleaning process, uh, Babco. Okay. So. Everybody, I got my parsley out. I got my parsley all ready to go. Let's just go ahead and pluck the leaves right from the stems because the stems, they tend to be a little bit woody. Uh, they tend to be a little bit fibrous in texture and I really, really do not like the way they feel in my mouth. A lot of people, they say, oh, you can do cilantro stems and parsley stems. Sure, they have flavor, but I really, really hate the texture of them above all else. So let's go ahead and get all of our parsley onto the cutting board. All we gotta do, my friends, is just pluck it. Just pluck it and pluck it and pluck it. I'm gonna go ahead and give you guys a better view of me in the meantime, because this is a bit of a mindless activity, I think. So all that we're really doing right now is just plucking. We're just plucking. Are cilantro stems tougher than parsley stems? No, Tarina. In fact, I would say the opposite. I would say parsley stems are the really, really tough ones. It also depends on the maturity of the parsley, right? Because the older these kinds of plants get, the thicker the stems, the thicker the leaves. Um, and also, really important for me, everybody, I want my parsley super thinly sliced. I hate massive leaves of parsley. It feels almost papery and it lingers in your mouth. I really do not like that texture. These guys are a little bit yellow, they're a little bit wilted, so I'm gonna go ahead and set them aside. We're gonna discard those. And just keep on plucking, my friends. Keep on plucking, get all of those lovely little leaves off of the stems. Okay, okay, and we're almost done. But yeah, I think plucking it is essential for parsley and not so much for cilantro. Then that becomes personal preference, okay? So, parsley is out, parsley is all ready to go, my friends. So, remember when I talked about the red onions? We slice, we do not chop. I'm going to say this again for everybody uh, uh, in the back. We slice, we do not chop. If you were to take these herbs and chop them, it will crush it and it will destroy it. Everybody, look at the knife. If you chop it, you're only using this much of your knife. It is a lot less surface area, it is not as delicate, and you end up crushing your herbs. They turn brown, they oxidize, and they do not uh, preserve a lot of their flavor as a result. Everybody, for optimal herbs, we always slice, always with a sharp knife. I need to hear everybody say, yes, chef, please, and thank you. So here's what we do. 
We take our herbs and we bundle it up in our hands. We bundle it up, we bundle it up nice and tight so it doesn't really just spill out all over the place. Bundle it up and then set it onto the cutting board. Bundle it up the best that we can. It's gonna spill out here and there and that's okay. That happens. So everybody, take your bundle, use your pinky and your thumb to keep this little lump together, use your other three fingers to guide the knife and slice it and slice it, not chop it. You have no idea how gentle I'm being, okay? You have no idea how gentle I'm being right now. I'm being so gentle, I'm being so delicate, my friends. We're slicing the herbs. We're not chopping it, we're slicing. Super delicate, go slow, okay? You wanna barely hear the knife hit the cutting board. You don't wanna see any chopping. I don't wanna see you going at this and going brrr all the way through, just slice it. Slice it, and we're gonna be looking for some nice, really, really small pieces. People say, oh, you should never slice parsley. You should never slice cilantro because it bruises it. If you do my method, look, the cutting board is not getting wet. It is not becoming uh, full of all of the juices, right? All that we're doing, my friends, is we're taking it, and we're going in there, and we're gently, 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 gently slicing it. There you go, that's it. That's all that it takes. That's all the work that we need to do for this bad boy, my friends. Just slice it up. And I'm looking for the finely minced parsley. The way that you mince it is up to you, ultimately. If you want whole leaves, you can go ahead and do that. But my goal is for the parsley flavor to infuse into the onions. My goal is to not bite into a massive chunk of parsley. Okay, so let's go ahead. That's right, thank you, thank you, Rudha, for, for policing the chat a little bit there. That was a little much. Okay, so everybody, I am really, really looking for a very, very small mince here. That is how I want my marinated onions to be. Again, it is entirely personal preference and it is entirely up to you for your sumac onions or any kind of marinated onion. There you go, slice it up, nice and thin, nice and thin, nice small pieces. Just go gentle. Just go gentle and gentle and gentle and gentle and gentle. Also, Everybody, you know what, I got a feeling. I kind of want to put my webcam on to 60 FPS. It can do that if it's 720. I realized I forgot to do that before the stream today. I want you all to give me one second. The music is going to stop for just a second, everybody. So please forgive me as I quickly go ahead and get that. Okay, I think this might now be in 60 FPS. Although I don't know yet. I don't think so. Because the stream is now outputting at 720 until we get like the Twitch encoder settings. So hopefully, guys let me know, is this camera any smoother? Does this look any better, the webcam? The overhead shot that is? So come back in there and just keep on slicing. Keep on slicing. all the way through until we get the desired consistency of the parsley. I'm gonna go, pro go probably through this one last time and then we'll be all set. There you go, there you go. Excellent, lovely. 60 FPS indeed? Okay, previously I opted to just have it at 30 FPS because I wanted it at 1080. Everybody, webcams suck. There's not a single webcam exists that can do 1920 at 60 FPS. They're all 720 and 60, but because we're outputting at 60, it'll be all fine. So hopefully that's a little improvement uh, for all of you that we've actually never had. We've never had a 60 FPS webcam before. Okay, everybody, my parsley is at the desired consistency. Bottom of the cutting board is not wet at all. It is nice and fresh, it is nice and vibrant still. Let's go ahead and add all of the parsley in with the onions, my friends. So all that we have in here, we have parsley, we have salt, we have some of the acid. Again, you could use lemon juice, you could use red wine vinegar. Uh, in my case, I'm using lime juice because I had a lime to get rid of. And then my lovely red onions alongside the sumac. Let's go ahead and mix it up, my friends. And all that we're going to do now is just let it sit until we're ready to use it. 
Just let it sit, wake it up. We can taste it for the seasoning now to see if it needs any more sumac, if it needs any more salt, but I got a feeling that this is gonna be more than fine. So just break up the pieces, just make sure that they're all nice and individual. Don't mash them, of course. I'm just making sure that they're all nice and separated. Okay, nice and separated, nice and separated. And I'm gonna have a little taste. Delicious, excellent, citrusy, limey, it's got the parsley in there. And then my friends, just let it sit. This is one of those things that get better and better as they sit in the fridge. Put this in a salad, put this on a sandwich, top a soup with this. There's so much that you can do with these kinds of red onions, my friends. Okay, these are so lovely, they're so versatile, they're so delicious. It doesn't just have to be bound to exclusively Middle Eastern cooking as we're doing today. This is gonna be the topping for my stroganoff. So let's go ahead and top that off. And everybody, I've got into the habit of labeling and dating everything just so that you know exactly what's in it. Because if you cook as often as I do, sometimes you forget what things are. Sometimes you don't know when you made something. So in my kitchen now always lives a little bit of masking tape and a nice little Sharpie. And I'm just gonna write what I've made. Sumac onion. And today's the 17th. And all that we're gonna do, everybody, we're just gonna put this into the fridge until we're actually ready to use it, until we're ready to properly garnish with it. Sumac onions, really, really simple. Lime juice, again, not super traditional, but I don't care about tradition. We got parsley, we got sumac, we got some red onions, and a little bit of salt. It's gonna be acidic, it's gonna be citrusy, it's gonna be herbaceous, it's going to be an amazing topping. The reason why I wanted to do this again is because I had the leftover onion, and I wanted to use up my onion before it ended up going bad, my friends. Okay, and then also, I wanted to innovate on the stroganoff. Think of what a stroganoff is. It's meat in this beefy, rich sauce, okay? Um, it's creamy, it's rich, it's fatty. I want those acidic onions to be able to provide some contrast for this. Okay, so yeah, Tarina, masking tape is not just genius, that is what they do in the restaurants. That is what happens in the restaurants. Okay, also MRQ, welcome on in. It is lovely to have you. So, gonna go ahead and throw this into the dishwasher. All that we did so far, we salted the beef and we made the sumac onions for the garnish. What else do we have left to do? We, well, we have to chop the onions that are gonna get sauteed into the stroganoff. We have to chop up the mushrooms. We have to do some of our herb prep, some of our garlic prep. So, let's go ahead and begin with all of that now. So, let's come back to my overhead shot, everybody. If you thought that we did not have enough onions, it is time for onions part two. Electric, no, that's too cringe, it's too dated, I can't say that. Okay, onions, I got some onions, let's go ahead and make some use out of them. Um, now, this is a big ass onion. Do I actually want all of this onion? This is, for all intents and purposes, a medium to large onion. You can never really have too many onions, but in a dish like this, I'm really thinking about the balance. If I have too many onions going into this, it, the dish is going to end up being a little bit too sweet for my taste. The wine is going to contribute a lot of sweetness. So, as a result, I think I've ultimately decided on just using half an onion. As always, everybody, we first start off by decapitating it, cut off the head, then we cut it in half lengthwise, just like so. And then half of this onion I'm gonna put into a little baggie and put it into my fridge. I don't need all that onion, everybody. That is a pretty decently sized onion. If you're European, your mind can't handle the size of American onions. I love every time that we have a European in chat and they see what I call a large onion and they go, well, Jesus Christ, daughter. Those are huge. It's always so entertaining. So half an onion for today is gonna to be perfect because the onion is not the star of the show. The onion is there to provide us some flavor, my friends, okay? The onion is there to provide its sweetness. The onion is there to cook down it's to make the sauce nice and delicious, but it's not an onion stroganoff. It is a beef stroganoff at the end of the day. So let's go ahead and peel up the onion, my friends. Let's peel it up. Let's get all of that skin off of it. And so now we have to think about the kind of cut that we want on the onions. So remember when I said, I don't want massive pieces of onion and I want it to contribute its flavor into the sauce. As a result, for today, the slice of the onion is gonna be a small dice. Everybody, size matters in cooking. The size of your onions matter because the smaller that you cut something, 
The less onion pieces that you'll feel, but the sweeter the sauce will become. The bigger the onion pieces, the more of a chance that you have to bite into something, but the less it contributes to the overall dish. If you're making a stir fry and you want big pieces of onion, or you want big pieces of onion in your stroganoff, you are absolutely welcome to go ahead and do so. But for my intentions, I want small pieces of onion, but I want it to contribute to the sauce instead of uh, it being an explicit component. So. Everybody, butt on. This is the root of the onion, nice and attached. All I'm going to go ahead and do is actually first tie up my hair because it's getting in the way. Okay, and everybody, we're going to be going for a nice small dice on this onion. So we're gonna do the fan method. We're gonna fan it out. We're not cutting all the way through. As you see, we're not cutting all the way through to the end. We're just making a bunch of incisions. We're fanning out the onion. We're fanning out the onion. We're fanning out the onion. We fan it out. Everybody, the onion is still held together. We don't slice through so that it doesn't all fall apart. Next, I take the onion here and I make a few horizontal incisions. Slice in. Slice in. Everybody, last but not least, time to get the dice of our dreams. Ready? Slice, onion, beautiful. Slice, onion, beautiful. Look at that. Nicely, beautifully diced onions. Not too big, not too small, but something that will be able to contribute into the overall sauce. A nice, lovely small dice, and it's even. When it's nice and evenly cut, my friends, it's gonna be nice and evenly cooked. The fan method keeps all of the onion together as you cut it so it doesn't all immediately just spill out. Okay, it's not the way that your mom cut onions. It's not the way that your grandma cut onions. We do it better in the year 2024. So that's all of the onion that I'm going to need for you today, my friends. I'm going to go ahead and get that into a little bowl and out of sight and out of mind. But actually, I could probably just do that onto a plate. I'm going to try to use less dishes as I cook. I have a nasty habit of using way too many all the time. And so the method that I'm going to be doing is to have things on plates instead of all individual bowls. It's important to get your prep done ahead of time, okay? But if you have everything in individual bowls, that is so many more dishes to do. So instead, all I'm going to do, my friends, is section it off onto a plate. Now. We don't keep it on the cutting board. The cutting board is a work surface. You do not store ingredients on it. I need to hear another yeah, chef, please and thank you. You do not take a cutting board to the stovetop. Absolute nonsense, bad form, bad technique. You want to put your food onto a separate little plate or a separate little bowl, okay? You do not want to carry things from board to uh, the actual you know, stove itself, okay? Never, never, never. So. That part's done. Let's go ahead and do my mushrooms. So everybody, I have some lovely white button mushrooms here. Now, how do we clean mushrooms and what are some of the misconceptions? Classical French theory says, oh, you must never wash mushroom. Complete nonsense. Yes, mushrooms soak up a little bit of liquid if you were to wash them under running water. But mushrooms are pretty filthy. They got a lot of dirt, they got some mycelium in there sometimes, okay? Washing them under some running water with a little brush does the job. Okay, we're going to be doing a wet mushroom cooking method, which I'll go into in a little bit and I'll talk about the importance of, but everybody, how many times have you had greasy, oily mushrooms? They weren't uh, nice and properly caramelized. They seem like you put them into the pan, they stop sauteing, they soak up the fat, the pan is dry, and then it looks like it's boiling. How many times has that happened to you? And the answer is, probably has happened to all of you. I'm gonna walk you through the cooking method for these bad boys so that you can get some perfectly cooked mushrooms. That being said, let's talk about how to actually prep them. We're gonna keep the stems on. These are white butter mushrooms. White butter mushrooms have very, very tender stems, but the bottom of it is going to get cut off because that tends to be the most dried out part. And if you would like, you could save all of your mushroom scraps and trimmings for the mushroom stock. But these are just not necessarily the best to eat. So I, I like to cut off the bottom half, the bottom chunk of the stem itself. Get all of those guys out of there, out of sight and out of mind. Cut them out, cut them out of here. Get them out of there, my friends. They don't make for the best eating, they're just a little bit dried out. And again, if you'd like, you can save them for the mushroom stock. I'm gonna start building a freezer supply of vegetable scraps at some point soon for uh, stocks, but not yet. I'm not ready to do so yet. I'm gonna go ahead and dispose of these. And so, let's think about the way that we wanna cut these. Everybody, a stroganoff has mushrooms as the highlight. So, we want decently sized cut mushrooms. Although, the way that you really cut mushrooms at the end of the day, honestly, 
it'll just work out. They're really nice and meaty chunks. So I'm just gonna cut this in half. I'm gonna cut this into quarters, and then I'm going to cut these really, really big ones into eighths so that we can get everything roughly the same size. A slice of the chop doesn't really matter. Mushrooms are one of the easiest things that you can cut in a kitchen, my friends. So some nice, big, meaty chunks of mushrooms. So again, the big ones I'm cutting into eighths, and the small ones I'm gonna cut into either sixths or fourths, just so that everything is able to cook as evenly as possible. So get them in there, cut them up, cut up these bad boys, get it done, and get it done. I love mushrooms, that's right. The meat of the forest. They're meaty, they're delicious. Everybody, we're not gonna have any soggy mushrooms. They're gonna be properly browned. They're gonna be properly caramelized. I'm gonna show you just how delicious mushrooms can be. Mushrooms, I think, are one of the things that a lot of, especially Americans, have a lot of not amazing associations with. People associate mushrooms with really, really like, you know, crappy canned mushrooms, or like uh, cream of mushroom soup, which can be sometimes endearing if that's what you're going for. But I'm gonna show you just how beautiful mushrooms can be. These are the cheapest mushrooms at my store. They're not organic. These are not fancy mushrooms. These are not even shiitakes. These are just white button mushrooms. And yet, they're still going to come out really delicious and special. These guys, I'm gonna cut into thirds. We're gonna cut them into thirds because they're a little bit smaller and we wanna match the size of everything. Tarina, you said, chef, now that you don't live with your mom, you might get a cast iron skillet. Anything else you might get with the move? Um, I don't know. I think something that's definitely coming to mind, I have a little bit more space. I'm definitely thinking about owning a dehydrator at some point. I would love to get into dehydrating some leftover produce, uh, especially like fresh fruits, doing dried fruits. Uh, I think that would be really, really fun. So that's the only really, really big thing that's coming to mind as in big purchases. And so everybody, you see the volume of mushrooms that we have? It's all gonna shrink down, I promise. It's all gonna shrink down. Mushrooms, they collapse more than anything else. They really, really cook down. If you've ever cooked mushrooms, you know exactly how much they shrink. So, get that sliced up, and let's get the last one done. And again. It doesn't really matter. Everybody, don't overthink your mushrooms. Again, these bad boys, they can and will shrink up. Okay, actually, I'm looking at this now, and I'm going, I don't want to accidentally, eh, you know what, they'll be fine. On the plate, they'll be more than okay. So, mushrooms, onions, all of them cut up, all of them ready to go for you later. I'm gonna go ahead and set that behind me right now so that it is out of sight and out of mind. Next, it is time for my least favorite kitchen task of all time. A step that I hate, and that is taking time off of the stem. Taking stems off of the leaves from cilantro and parsley, easy, wonderful, fantastic. This is so annoying, but everybody, I don't want to put sprigs of thyme into my final dish. Okay, I find that to be incredibly inconvenient for the consumer. They're woody and you have to pick them out. So, begrudgingly, and in the interest of all the people that I will be feeding, I will be the one to go ahead and pluck the leaves off of the stem. Anybody that's done this knows how much this step sucks. Some people, they just add in the sprigs and then they take them out or they even leave them on somebody's plate. But everybody, a very important fundament, fundamental belief of mine is that there is nothing on my plate that is inedible. I don't want to serve people food with bones in it. I don't want to serve people food with things that they have to pick out of it. How many times have you gotten, let's say, Indian food and it has whole spices that you have to pick out? I find that to be incredibly, incredibly annoying. And so I want to really, really optimize the eating experience for people. Do I have any dishes that come to mind thinking of lentils and mushrooms? Uh, lentils and mushrooms, I mean, the first thing is a soup. The next thing is a salad. Saute the mushrooms, do a lentil salad. Let the mushrooms cool down properly. Or alternatively, do a marinated mushroom after it's been cooked. That would be also really, really lovely. Okay. But yeah, everybody, my goal is to make the eating experience flow. I want people to sit down and to be able to enjoy the meal, especially because I'm also cooking for my roommate. I do not want people to have to pluck out little bones, little spices, little thyme uh, stems. It is all incredibly, incredibly annoying for the consumer. So keep in mind, your guest, you're the chef. Think about how much effort, think about how much you actually care about the person that you're going to be feeding this to, okay? So 
Think about that. Make that decision. Make that executive decision. And everybody it just shows that you care. When you put in this much effort, when you go in and you're plucking the time off of the stems, it just shows that you care. That you've thought and you've put in that extra little bit of consideration into their own eating experience. So everybody, while I'm doing this plucking step, let's do a little bit of housekeeping. If you aren't following this new channel quite yet, you are, whoa, hold on. Do I need to adjust this scene because I made it 720p? Do I actually need to adjust it? Oh, everybody, one second, please, and thank you. I made a bit of a mistake. You know what? I think I've ultimately decided that that's going to be a little bit too much effort. I might need to go back to 1920-1080 for my camera because I don't have it all set up. So give me a second. Okay, tragically, we're not going to be able to do uh, 60 FPS today. It will be available through Friday, though. Okay. Um, yeah. So, everybody, a little bit of housekeeping. If you haven't already done so, please, please, please support the Patreon. My goal is to be able to do the cooking streams full-time one day. Also, given the fact that Twitch has now done this thing where subscriptions are $6 instead of $5, uh, man. Oh, man. Uh, if you can, the best way to support it is on the Patreon. If you had to choose between the Patreon and the Twitch, uh, the Patreon gives me a much better, better cut. Uh, and so my goal is to be able to do this full time one day. The Patreon doesn't explicitly give you any benefits, my friends. The goal of the Patreon is purely for those of you that have the extra money. Uh, it does go a really long way. So, Blinkrich, you said, guy downstairs gave me a bag of time he didn't know what to do with. I dried it out and ran fingers down stem in reverse direction, and it was about an eight ounce jar. That is an eight ounce jar of time. Jesus, that's a lot of time. That is, that is, that is a lot more that I would know what to do with. I don't really like dried thyme, by the way. I find that dried thyme, I mean, the flavor is so much more muted, and then the leaves are really, really woody. Uh, whereas with fresh thyme, I mean, fresh herbs will always have a little bit of an edge over dried ones. Okay, so that's almost done. I still see a few little stems that I could have probably done a better job of picking out. Again, this is the most annoying herb to do this to. Of all of the different herbs, thyme really, really takes the cake for who can be the most insufferable to actually pluck. So all I'm doing is I'm just running my fingers through it and getting those leaves all plucked out, my friends. All of them plucked, all of them gone, all of them out of there. A few more sprigs of thyme to go. Please save me. And I'm not really measuring the amount that I'm using today. I'm just going purely by vibe, and that's what it means to cook at home. You don't want too much time ever, because time can become really, really, really overpowering. Uh, similar to rosemary, if this is an herb that you want to add towards the end of the cooking process, if you add it too close in the beginning, it does tend to lose a lot of its flavor. So keep it going, get it all plucked. That is right, everybody loves doing the time puns. Everybody does, it is a day one food joke to make, and you all can't help yourselves. Almost done. Almost done. A little bit more to go. Please. We're almost there, my friends. I promise you that. Okay? Look at this lovely little bunch of thyme. All of that work for this little thyme. Thank goodness it has that much flavor. Thank goodness it's that concentrated. Because if you needed to use as much as you would for something like parsley and cilantro, I would never, ever cook with this. Not in a thousand years. Okay? Almost done. Almost done. We're almost done with it all, my friends. A little bit more to go. And again, the stems, they just have such an unpleasant texture to them. The leaves are nice and edible, though. And the stems, they don't actually add that much in terms of aroma into the final dish. Okay. So, I think that this stupid step is finally done with. Last but not least, the only thing that I want to go ahead and check out now is just make sure that I don't have any little pieces of stem, like that little guy. And I think that's going to be more than fine for us. So we don't have to slice it. We don't have to chop it or anything. It's all been plucked off of the stem. So this can go in as it is. And I'm just going to add this into my cute little condiment bowl. Love these things to be able to organize. We did it. 
We did it. The time is done. I'm going to go ahead and put that behind me now. Put that behind us. Put that into the past. And now let's go ahead and do the garlic. Does parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme actually make anything? Well, Chowyo, you've described a typical poultry seasoning mix. Um, what, what do you mean, does it make anything? I'm not sure what you've just described here, like what you're asking me. So, everybody, garlic. I love garlic, and so should you. I have three big flat, uh, fat cloves of garlic, excuse me. Can you do the thyme again? I missed it. Bread Williams, not in a thousand years. Okay. So all that we're going to do is take a bench scraper to peel off the skin and we flatten it. We smush it down and we're going to do this with each and every single one of them. I don't know what that song is. I guess I, that's a reference that I completely missed. I'm sorry. So let's go ahead and get all of my garlic cloves nice and peeled up. Smashing them separates the skin from the rest of the clove. We're going nice and slow today because once the cooking happens, it's not going to take all that much time. Okay. I didn't know what this song was. I don't know what that song is at all. I've never heard of it in my life. Okay. Zoomer moment. It's not that I'm a zoomer. It is also not to be like, oh, I'm quirky and I don't know things. But I don't know a lot of pop culture references in general. I don't really watch movies. I don't listen to a lot of music aside from like the very specific kinds of music that I like. Uh, and I don't watch a lot of TV shows. As a result, I feel like I miss out on a lot of different things. So. Everybody, as always, the thing that I preach again and again and again and again and time and time again, chopping garlic sucks. Slicing garlic sucks. It takes time. Get a garlic press. Get a garlic press. I don't care that it's a unitasker. It gets the job done so easily. Take it and press it. And that's all the work that you need to do. Take it, my friends, and press it and press it and press it and press it. Take your garlic press and press it. And that is all the work that you need to do. I miss my old garlic press. I'm probably going to buy a better one because admittedly this one kind of sucks. Sorry, no shade of my roommate, but my old garlic press was much better than this one. And press it and press it to your heart's content. Everybody, just get it done. Get it all nice and processed. Okay, flip this bad boy around. Get it all out. Get it all in there. This is three fat cloves of garlic because guess what? I love garlic and so should you. You can never have too much garlic in something. I could have probably made this even more aggressively garlicky if I really wanted to. Okay, so I'm gonna go get this big old smushed piece of garlic out of here because that's still plenty good for eating. What happens to the old garlic press? Well, it belonged to my mom before I moved, so I didn't feel like it would have been right of me to, uh, to take it. Everybody remember that when it comes to garlic, the finer that you crush it, the finer that you chop it, the more that you process it when it is raw, the more pungent it becomes. If you want to slice garlic, it is not going to have the same flavor, even if it is the same amount of garlic. It is not going to have the same amount of flavor as uh, crushed garlic. Okay, so my garlic, because it went through the garlic press, it's going to be super, super pungent and super, super aromatic. So you don't need as much if you're pressing it, but if you choose to slice it for some unknown reason, then you're going to need to use a lot more than what I just did. Okay, everybody remember the best time to clean a garlic press is yesterday, so poke the holes with a little brush. Throw it in a dishwasher, but poke it when it is still wet. Do not poke it when it's dry, because otherwise it's all going to get stuck in there. It's going to be so much more difficult to clean. Clean it now, my friends. Okay, let's clean off my cutting board. Let's get some stuff out of here. And I think that the majority of the vegetable prep is done for today. We got the onions cut up. We got the garlic crushed. We got the meat seasoned with the salt, which has been sitting and being nice and patient for us. Um, it's sung by Simon and Garfunkel. I see. So, what is the order of operations that ensues? Everybody, when it comes to a stroganoff, the order of ingredients matters. I'm gonna say this again and again and again. The order of ingredients matters, and I need to hear yes, chef, from everybody watching. This is gonna be important, so I want you all to tune in. I want you all to make sure that you're listening, okay? So, this is a one-pan meal essentially. This is all going to be happening inside of the same pot. It's all going to be happening inside of the same cooking surface. Okay? So, the order and the layering of everything matters. Because here's the thing. Let's say that we do the onions first. What happens? The bottom gets sticky and covered in sugar. 
and then that will make it really difficult for us to brown the meat. The order is meat first, then we do the mushrooms, because with the mushrooms we'll be doing a water cooking method which will deglaze all of the fond on the bottom of the pan. After the mushrooms will go the onions, because the onions are the stickiest and the sweetest component. After which we do the wine, and then everything else. But the order of operations matters. Beef first. Beef first and foremost, my friends. Okay? So, what are my tongs? There's my tongs. Let's go ahead and get my pan nice and preheated. Everybody, the tool that I will be using today, the pan that I'll be using today, is my nice, lovely Mavier clad stainless steel pan. Guess what? Stainless steel pans can be amazing. Most people do not know what to do with a stainless steel pan. So many companies have pushed non-stick pans, but let me tell you right now, my friends, non-stick pans are incredibly niche. You only really, really need them for like, I don't know, pancakes they're good for, they're good for eggs, but when it comes to meat, stainless steel is gonna be able to give you the temperature and everything that you need. Why do people complain about stainless steel? People complain that food sticks to stainless steel. And then people on food YouTube, they say, oh, all you have to do is heat it up enough until the water dances. Nonsense. All of that is nonsense. Everybody, I need you to tap in. I need you to make sure that you're listening. I'm going to teach you how to have a stainless steel pan that is going to be perfectly heated that food does not stick to. Food is not going to stick to it. It's going to be evenly heated. We start off with a medium to medium low heat. The key is to heat this up slowly, my friends. Because if you heat this up fast on a high heat and you think the temperature is there, you're going to develop hot spots and cool spots. So once again, the thing that I talk about again and again, the thing that I talk about all the time is heating it up slowly. Heat it up slowly, medium low heat. Next, for even heat conductivity, we're also going to be heating it up with some oil inside. This is a clad pan. It has an aluminum coil inside to make sure that it gets heated as evenly as possible. Adding in a little bit of oil on all stainless steel pans will really, really help out as well. Okay, so everybody, medium to medium low heat. Now, we're gonna be cooking the beef directly on this, okay? The beef needs a little bit of fat. We don't wanna use olive oil, we don't wanna use butter. This is going to be relatively long high heat cooking. We wanna use a neutral cooking oil. This is canola oil. You want highly refined oils. Peanut oil, canola oil, vegetable oil, so on and so forth. We just need a little bit. It's going to help with lubrication. It's also going to help make sure that the meat doesn't stick as much. It's not frying, it's just gonna seal in a little bit of oil, my friends. I have no idea how much that is. We're not measuring and it's okay. So. There is a huge misconception when it comes to cooking beef. One of the biggest misconceptions is that you need everything to be on a maximum heat, super, super high. Not true at all. Medium and slow is gonna be the way to go. However, we're not gonna be cooking the steak to completion at this stage. In fact, we want the steak to be as cold as possible. The only goal now is to develop the crust on the beef. I want the beef to be essentially raw on the inside because the beef is going to go back into the sauce and it's going to finish cooking inside of the sauce. My goal now is to develop flavor. Everybody, color equals flavor. The more that you brown something, the more that you develop it, the more that you roast it, the more of a crust that you build up, the more of the fawn that you develop, the more of those meaty roasted flavors that you then also develop. So, my goal is to not cook through the beef at the stage. My goal is only to develop a really, really beautiful crust on the beef, okay? So, we're gonna heat this pan up nice and slowly until it is super, super, super hot because I don't wanna cook the beef through, I just wanna develop a crust. Can you teach us how to cook an egg? Asking for a friend, they don't know how. So, Goyles Witchies, absolutely. One of these streams, I'll do something that'll involve an egg at some point or another. I feel like we never really cook with eggs here because it's almost only like dinner food, but I think we'll do like a rice bowl with a sunny side up egg. Eggs can be tricky. Eggs are a little bit fickle. Eggs are all about the heat control, okay? So everybody, out goes, while my pan is slowly heating up, slowly but surely. Okay, again, nice, medium, medium, low, Uso. Because we wanna heat that pan up evenly with no hot spots and cool spots. Let's look at my beef one more time. Come take a look at Mr. Beef. So, all that we did was we seasoned this an hour in advance. We seasoned it with kosher salt. I want you all to completely forget about this culinary myth 
that for some reason or another, that you cannot season a piece of meat until just before that you cook it. It is complete and absolute nonsense. I think I can also probably rotate this a little bit to better show the pan. There you go. I think that'll do just fine for us. Okay, everybody, it is an absolute culinary myth. It is a myth that you have to season it just before it goes on. Okay, please, 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 please dry brine it. That is how we ensure that the piece of meat is going to be nicely and beautifully and evenly seasoned, my friends. Okay, through the process of dry brining, letting it sit with the salt, the meat is going to become nice and seasoned, not just on the outside, Okay, and then the seasoning is gonna be able to also help retain moisture. This is called dry brining. Do this with chicken, do this with fish, do this with beef, do this with pork, do this with lamb. Any piece of meat will benefit from being dry brined. Now, only thing that we need to consider, because I didn't let this go on as long as it should, the surface of it is still a little bit wet. We're going to pat this dry with a paper towel. If you dry brine this effectively, you're not gonna need a paper towel, the outside won't be wet. Okay, if we put this onto a hot pan as it is, you can imagine what happens. Wet meat, hot oil, it's gonna splash, it's going to make a bit of a mess. So be generous, use it and pat it. That's right, God's a you got it. Pat, 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 pat it dry. Even that little bit of moisture, it'll just make your life a little bit easier. Grab that paper towel or a kitchen towel if you have a system to be able to reuse them. I don't have that set up yet in my home. You can see the bottom of it, quite wet. Guys, pat it dry, press it down, get it all patted, get all of that liquid out of there. Because again, it's just going to splash and it's going to make your crust not as good as it can be. We're cooking the beef in as big of a piece as possible. Again, the goal is to sear this whole and then cut it into little pieces. Everybody, I hate this method of cutting meat into your final strips if you're sealing it. You'll never be able to build up the caramelization that you need. Meat is like a sponge. If you cook it, it squeezes the liquid out of it. If it's in really, really small pieces, it cooks super, super fast, the meat gets wet, and you're not going to be able to develop the crust of your dreams. The key to a beautiful crust is to use a whole piece of meat. Munha, thank you for stopping by. Thank you for being here. It was lovely to have you, as always. You can see this beautiful flat iron steak that we're using today. Let's go ahead and get rid of that paper towel. And everybody, I can tell you right now that that oil is exactly where it needs to be. It is nice and hot. It is slightly smoking at the stage as well. That might be a little bit too hot, but it's going to lose some heat when we add on the piece of beef. So beef, let's add that bad boy in, get it onto the pan, and then I'm gonna also turn on the fan. I also finally have a vent over my stove, so that's gonna make my life so much easier. Do I like Brazilian barbecue, the all-you-can-eat ones? So I'm Kapoor. I actually have an answer for you. And the answer is, conceptually, I don't really, really like it. Uh, I like to eat balanced meals. I don't like all-you-can-eat constructs. And I'm going to explain to you why. In a very capitalist sense, the idea of all-you-can-eat scratches your brain. Because then you go in and you think, oh, I want to get the most bang for my buck. I want to save as much money eating as possible. And then you end up eating so much meat, you go in your head, well, you know, it's the same idea with buffets. It's the same idea with Korean barbecue. You want to be meat maxing instead of actually building a balanced meal. As a result, I find all you can eat to be quite stressful as a construct. I find it to be really, really stressful. You end up eating a lot of meat and then you don't feel so good. So I like the food. I like the way that it tastes. I don't like what it makes me feel. I don't like what it does to my brain. And I don't like what it does to other people either. Everybody, clean as you go. I'm gonna put my sheet tray into the dishwasher. And so, another steak myth that I want to dispel, another massive steak misconception, is the idea that you absolutely must only flip the piece of meat once. That is nonsense. Everybody, to get an even crust developed, you need to rotate the piece of beef often. Rotate it often to be able to get the hot spots and the cool spots. And I'm going to explain to you why. I want you all to look at the pan. I want you all to look at the pan right now. You see the empty parts of the pan. Those are really, really hot. Look at the part of the pan that is touching the beef. That is gonna be the coldest part because the beef is literally sucking up the energy. It is literally sucking up the heat. So every 45 seconds or so, we're gonna rotate it. This also helps us to develop a nice even crust and it lets the parts of the pan heat back up where the beef used to be. 
Rotate it, move it around, my friends. Do not listen to the grill bros that say, oh, never touch your steak. You put it on the grill and you must never flip it. You must never move it around. It is all nonsense. Listen to me, I know the way. You gotta trust me, my friends. With a little bit of searing, we're already able to develop a slightly golden crust. Take it, move it over there, and we're gonna keep this thing moving. All the while, we're developing a little fond. It's gonna come out, it's gonna be nice and delicious, my friends. Rotate it, spin it, do what you gotta do with this bad boy. The goal is to develop a nice, beautiful crust. Next, why do we not actually uh, use a super high heat? A high heat might help us to develop a crust sooner. But keep in mind, my friends, look at the pan. Look what's happening in the pan. You see all those golden bits? That's called fond. Fond is so, uh, water soluble. It's going to give the dish a nice meaty taste. If our heat is high, our fond will burn. If you go with a nice medium heat and you do this slowly, my friends, you're going to end up developing a beautiful crust without burning the fond. So take the meat and give it a little rotation. Once again, we're going to develop that crust. We're going to get it nicely and beautifully browned. And that's right, Dr. Slowbro, fond equals flavor. You do not want to scorch the fond. Burnt fond is going to make the rest of it taste at least a little bit better. And that's not what we're looking for. That's not what we want. We want nice, delicious beef. We want a nice, delicious stroganoff, my friends. Okay, it's just been seasoned with some salt at the stage. Nothing else, nothing crazy at the moment. Okay, once again, keep it rotating. And we could probably also just take a look as to what the crust looks like so far. Okay, I'm gonna grab the meat. Take a look, it's getting nice and golden, my friends, but it's still not as deep, it is not as developed as I would like it to be. You don't wanna keep the meat all on one part of the pan because then all of the fond will be on one part of the pan and all of that fond will then subsequently burn. Everybody, rotate it, keep it moving. That is the real trick, that is the real key to this. It's not so much of a secret as it is just good technique and good practice. I am here to teach you how to understand food and why things happen. So if you have any questions about this, because I know this was a lot, okay? I know this was a lot. I know this was a lot of different details. You can absolutely, uh, you know, just, just ask me, right? You can clarify. You can just clarify. This was a lot of details all at once. I'm sure it might have been a little bit confusing. I kind of just went like rapid fire mode. I spat all of it out. Uh, so if anybody needs any clarification about this or something else, feel free to ask me. Now things are gonna be slowing down. We did a lot of our prep. There's not gonna be that much more to do in the meantime. And so if you have any cooking questions whatsoever, uh, whatsoever, it can be about this dish, it can be about something else, feel free to ask me. My ultimate goal is to get you all cooking, is to get you all excited about cooking in a home setting, my friends. And so I wanna be able to help facilitate that any way I can. The fond is developing, the meat is getting nice and browned. New kitchen chef, that's right, Dreamer, I have moved out. This is my new kitchen. I no longer live with my mom. I uh, live on my own with my lovely roommate. We have a nice, beautiful kitchen. Uh, I'm really, really happy about it. Yeah. Fond in uh, French means both melt and bottom. I see. Thank you, Tarina. Thank you for the incredibly informative uh, lesson there. Okay, everybody, let's go give the meat a nice little flip skis now. The goal, again, I don't want this meat to be cooked through. I want this meat to be raw on the inside. Uh, this is a flat iron steak. Why do I want the meat raw on the inside? Because it's gonna finish cooking in the sauce. Why do we not cut into strips so the water doesn't leach out? Everybody, food content creators are full of shit. They have no idea what they're talking about. How many stir fry recipes have you seen where they say brown the meat and then it's a bunch of little strips, it's a bunch of little pieces, okay? And then you can see it's leaking out liquid. It is boiling in its own juices. And they say, oh, it's browning. Oh, we're building up caramelization. It is total and complete nonsense. That's why we keep it as a whole steak. We'll be able to develop all that lovely crust. Guys, look how crunchy this crust is. We're gonna do the knife thing with it, ready? We're gonna, you can hear 
how delicious and crispy that crust is. And all of that, my friends, is incredible, incredible flavor. The meat is effectively raw on the inside because I want to finish cooking it in the sauce. So give it a rotation. And guys, the best thing about this, the pan is not on a 10. It is not a super high heat. It is a medium heat. Look at how it's sliding around. There is not even a little bit of sticking. That is the magic of this. That is the magic of learning how to correctly use stainless steel pans. A good stainless steel pan will let you do this. Everybody, when I say it's sliding, I mean you can look how it's literally sliding. There is no stickage when I'm using a stainless steel pan because I have now taught you all how to have good form, how to have good technique, okay? All we wanna do is get it really, really nice and crusty. We wanna get that fawn nice and developed, okay? We wanna get all of those bits nice and browned on the bottom, all right? And it's coming along swimmingly. It's coming along beautifully at the moment, I must say. So keep it rotating again, just so that the crust is nice and evenly developed. Um, we could also try to do a crust around the sides of it, if we would like. We could try to do something like that. But honestly, I don't think it's that important to get the crust on the sides. If anything, it'll just lead to some uneven pieces. So we're just gonna mostly do it on the bottom. We'll take out some of the oil, um, and then we will do the mushrooms, okay? I'm quite fond of the fond. Yeah, that's right, there we go. You got it. Lovely. So, everybody, order of operations matters. We don't do the onions first because it's gonna make the pan sticky. After this is gonna be the mushrooms. We'll talk about the wet mushroom cooking method. We'll talk about the magic of it. We'll talk about the joy of it. We'll talk about what it exactly accomplishes, okay? The beef is just about ready to come out. Again, this is gonna be under rare at this point. It's a really, really, really thick piece of meat. The bottom is nice and beautifully crusty, my friends. So all I'm doing is just getting that crust finished and fully developed. Right, almost done. It's beautiful, it's crusty, it's a nice even crust because we kept rotating it too, right? It's looking amazing. I could probably go a little further on that side still. And that's exactly what we'll do. Just like that, my friends. It's gonna be delicious, it's gonna be beautiful, it's gonna be fantastic. I can't wait. Is everybody still watching? I wanna hear another Yashak, please, and thank you. Okay, everybody, I think it is now time for us to officially pull out Mr. Beef. He did a wonderful job for us today. He did excellent. Now, I am going to be removing the fat from this pan. The fat doesn't have that much flavor in it. It is just canola oil. If I add the mushrooms directly into the fat, they're going to soak it up and become greasy. This is a little bit wasteful, I know, but we need to extract this fat, my friends. So let's get some of it out of there. I'm just gonna take a little paper towel, try not to set it on fire, so don't leave it on there for too long. It's not gonna wipe out the fond. All it's going to do is get rid of the fat. The fond is stuck at the bottom of the pan. Next, pan, dry pan, mushrooms go in. And then we're going to flood it with water. We're going to talk about the magic of this method. We're going to talk about the benefits of doing it this way. This is the wet mushroom cooking method. Okay, and I'm gonna show you just how amazing it's gonna be. So mushrooms going. Next, water, my friends. We gotta get some lovely water. I don't know why I'm giving so many adjectives when I'm just describing, you know, what is effectively water. Don't worry about browning right now. So, welcome to the wet mushroom cooking method. So take it, use the water to deglaze the pan, my friends. Anything stuck to the bottom, get it all dissolved. Get it dissolved, get it dissolved, get it dissolved. Deglaze this pan. Deglaze it, deglaze it, deglaze it. Get everything that is stuck at the bottom and on the sides, get everything deglazed. So why am I doing this method? Why am I adding water in? Let me explain to you all why. There is a phenomenon that I am explicitly trying to avoid which is how many times, and I wanna hear a yesha from everybody who has had this happen to them. Have you decided to saute mushrooms? You heat up the fat, it's super hot, you add the mushrooms, they sizzle, but then all of a sudden, the pan is dry. The fat is soaked up, the fat is gone, and then it starts boiling in its own liquid. 
Why does that happen? Why do you end up with greasy mushrooms? They're not brown, they're not delicious, they're not sauteed, they're just oily. They become like these oily little sponges. Well, everybody, in order to answer this question, we need to analyze the structure of the mushroom. A mushroom, just like meat, is a wet sponge. But a mushroom is not just a wet sponge, it is like a sopping, oversaturated wet sponge. It has a little bit too much water in it. So here's what happens, my friends, here's what happens. Mushrooms, when they cook, the structure collapses. The water gets released, and then the water evaporates, and then it soaks up anything that's around it, indiscriminate of its fat or water. So, instead of it soaking up fat, we started off by essentially boiling it. We use the water as a heat uh, medium, okay, so that we can evenly cook the mushrooms. The mushrooms collapse, they release the liquid, they soak up as much liquid as they need to hold their texture. We evaporate the liquid and then we add fat. And my friends, with that method, we obtain beautiful caramelized mushrooms that are nice and brown, nice and evenly cooked, that are not greasy, that are not oily. It allows us to use a lot more fat in different stages of the cooking process. So make sure that you're deglazing the pan's fond, all of the fond that the beef originally gave us. Make sure that we're deglazing it, and the only thing that we gotta do now is collapse the mushrooms. Collapse them. They're going to shrink, they're going to shrivel up, and they're going to release water, and then the water is going to evaporate. This is going to take up a little bit of time, but trust the process. Trust it, and it's going to work out incredibly, exceptionally well. But in the meantime, all I'm doing is I am deglazing. I am going in with a wooden spoon, and I'm scraping off anything and everything that could be stuck to the bottom of the pan. Also, if you would like, you could season the mushrooms at this stage as well. We can season it later, we can season it sooner. This way they'll at least have a little bit of time to penetrate the mushrooms. Guys, seasoning in layers is so important. If you were to take all of the salt that you would normally use throughout the dish and add it towards the end, you will get a bunch of incredibly, inedibly salty liquid and then bland mushrooms, bland beef. Salt it in layers. By salting it in layers, we get the mushrooms evenly seasoned, we get the onions evenly seasoned, we get the sauce evenly seasoned. Every single component becomes as seasoned as it needs to be. Seasoning in layers is so, so, so important for anything that's not a cream stew, for anything that's not homogenous. If it is a stew, if it is a soup with a lot of different little pieces inside of it, seasoning it in layers is how that you get things to be really, really perfectly flavorful. How many times have you made a stew or a soup that tasted really, really nicely seasoned when it's fresh, and then you put it in the fridge, next day you reheat it, and then it tastes bland? That's because all the salt that you thought was in the sauce ended up penetrating the rest of the ingredients. If everything is evenly seasoned, if your mushrooms, if your onions, if your beef is, and then your sauces as well, the salt is going to stay nice and consistent. It's not going to go anywhere. There's not going to be any osmosis occurring. Everything is going to be as seasoned as it needs to be. Everybody, the mushrooms are collapsing. You can see how much volume they've begun to lose. Okay? And all we got to do now is just continue the collapsation stage, my friends. Just continue it and keep it going. Continue deglazing. Scrape off any of the proteins okay, that have come out of the beef, scrape off any of the proteins that have come out of the mushrooms and dissolve them in the liquid. You can see the liquid on the bottom of the pan. It's getting nice and brown. That's basically a mushroom stock that's forming. All the juices, do not drain it, do not strain it, and keep it inside of the pan. And keep it all cooking, my friends. Keep it cooking, keep it cooking. Keep it all cooking. And so, by the way, while this is happening, as a little reminder, my beef is resting. Look at my beautiful chunk of beef. Look at this beautiful thing of beef, my friends. This beef, oh, did my overhead camera stop? Oh, guys, I'm so sick of this camera. You know, for some reason, my camera doesn't want to work right now. And I have, okay, there you go.
There you go. There she is. Everybody, look at the crust on my beef. Look at the beautiful crust on my beef. It's nice and crispy. It's still raw on the inside because remember, it's going to be finished up in the sauce itself. The mushrooms are going. Everything is happening exactly the way that we needed it to. Everybody, the plan is all coming together. It's all coming together. It's everything is coming together. Let's go ahead and get all of that liquid onto the sides of the pan, everybody. Do not sleep on it. Let's get all of that fawn back in. Let's get all that fawn back in. Let's get those mushrooms continuing to cook. They have collapsed. We are now continuing to collapse them. We're continuing to evaporate that excess liquid, my friends. Okay? Beautiful, beautiful piece of steak right here. It's a little bit dark because the camera lighting here isn't necessarily the best at the moment. You thought that was a chocolate cake for a second? Yeah, I would go, oh. Guys, this meal with a chocolate cake, that would be it. That would be just like perfect. You know? Okay, in the meantime, there's a couple of other things that we can accomplish while the mushrooms are cooking because the mushrooms, they need patience, they need time. Don't rush it, okay? We're going to go ahead and do the spice mixture, which is not gonna be that many spices or anything. It's just going to be some paprika and some cayenne pepper. Okay, paprika, you see it sometimes in a stroganoff. I wanted some paprika inside of it. You don't really need it that much. It's going to add a little bit of color. It's going to add in a little bit of flavor. Ali, you're still making the time jokes. Can't believe it. So, and I also want some heat inside of this. I don't want this to be completely bland as it is. So I'm just gonna go get some paprika. Everybody with paprika, you already know, it is really, really bland as far as the spice goes. So we can do a pretty generous amount of it going into the actual shogunoff if we wanna be able to taste it. A little bit of paprika goes in, or a lot of it in my case. And then it will do a nice spoon of some cayenne pepper inside. And this is just for some heat, my friends. I want some heat in my stroganoff. I don't want it to be a completely bland, boiling Russian eating experience. Um, I know Russians do occasionally use the cayenne. I remember my grandfather, he always had a thing of specialty bought cayenne that he kept in a little deli container. And then he would add it to like everything that he eats. And I do mean everything. It was fascinating. He would add it to soups, he would add it to stews, he would add it to just about anything because uh, I think he was also really, really sick of bland Russian food, right? Uh, so, so, so anytime I use cayenne, it is such a specific ingredient. I don't cook with it often, but it does really remind me of him. It's a very specific association that I had. He always had a small deli cup labeled cayenne on it. He got it from a specialty market online instead of just getting cayenne from anywhere else for God knows which reason. Uh, and then he would always pinch it into his food. So that's a little memory that I have. So paprika and cayenne, gonna go ahead and set that behind me. Uh, next, let's go ahead and measure out some of the wet ingredients that we're going to need for today. Um, specifically, I have some mustard, I have some soy sauce that's gonna be going into the dish, I have some Worcestershire sauce, and I'm gonna be, of course, using my cute favorite little condiment cups. I'm gonna go back into the mushrooms, give those bad boys a little stir. Scrape up the bottom again, my friends, because as the pan gets dry, all of those proteins can and will stick to the bottom of the pan if you don't keep scraping it up. Scrape it up, make the proteins stick to the mushrooms and not the pan. So, so, so important. Okay, everybody, the mushrooms are soon gonna be sauteing. You wanna babysit the stage. You don't wanna step away too far. If you step away too far, okay, um, the water is gonna evaporate and the mushrooms are gonna burn on the bottom. Chef, do you think Hungarian paprika has a distinct taste compared to regular store-bought? Um, yeah, absolutely. P Hungarian paprika is just like any red pepper powder, okay? Uh, so they're made from all different kinds of chili. Some of them are smoked, some of them are spicy. Yeah, the answer is yes. This is just generic plain old paprika, so nothing fancy in my case. Everybody, I have some whole grain mustard, because guess what? I love whole grain mustard. I love the little beads. It's almost like caviar. I'm going to get a nice big, big, big couple of spoonfuls of whole grain mustard. Okay. Next addition. Now, you might be a little bit confused about why we're adding soy sauce or tamale in this, because this is not what you would associate with Western food. This is not what you would associate with Russian food or French food. Well, 
It's because soy sauce has a lot of savory tastes. I normally really, really hate saying umami because of how overused of a term it is, because of how it gets thrown around all over the place, but the soy sauce is going to add in a lot of additional meaty taste. I don't have a homemade chicken stock. I want a delicious meaty sauce. We're not going to add in so much soy sauce that it tastes like soy sauce, but we're just going to add in enough that we get some of the effects from it, my friends. It's also going to contribute to some of the salinity. So a little bit of soy sauce goes in, and then we're also going to go ahead and do Worcestershire sauce. Worcestershire sauce is essentially a Western spiced fish sauce. It is a fermented fish sauce, um, and it's really, really classic inside of a stroganoff. So we're going to go ahead and get a little bit of that in but not too much of it. You want to be quite sparing with it. Gods and I don't have any chicken stock. I'm going to be using powdered chicken bouillon today. Okay. So these bad boys, I'm going to keep still out just in case I want to use a little bit more of it. And now let's go ahead and come back to the stove. Remember when I said we have to babysit the mushrooms. This is when the mushrooms can burn. Everybody, the pan is getting dry. As the pan dries, the water evaporates, but all of the proteins stick to the bottom of the pan. So scrape it up while it's still wet. Scrape it up, scrape it up. Get all of that fond stuck to the mushrooms. Scrape it up, scrape it up. You can see that all the water has evaporated. The mushrooms have collapsed in the texture, my friends. Scrape up the bottom, scrape it up, scrape it up, scrape it up. Like your life depends on it. And then, as soon as we're done with this, we will begin the sauteing stage. Guys, good food takes time. Sauteed mushrooms don't happen in two minutes. They take 10 minutes, they take 15 minutes. You have to be patient and you have to give it the love because this way we actually develop real flavor. How many recipes say saute the mushrooms for five minutes? It's complete and utter nonsense, my friends. They're just recipe writers. They're just putting out content. They're not actually analyzing what's going on. So many recipes and dishes say, oh, brown this thing for so and so amount of time. And then you look at the video, you look at the pictures, and it's not actually browning. People just say things, and I'm not just saying things. I am here to make you understand why we're doing the things that we do. I'm here to make you guys feel things. I'm here to make you feel something. I'm here to build intuition. So. The mushroom pan is just about dry. And now while it is dry, we go in with a nice flavorful fat. Now I'm gonna do some olive oil. Russians, they don't typically really like olive oil that much, but I do. And I want my mushrooms to saute in that olive oil. Continue to scrape up the pan. Heat the pan back on up, my friends. Scrape it up. And now this is beginning to get nice and delicious and fried. Now we're beginning something special, my friends. Now the mushrooms are sauteing, they're sizzling away. You can see they're not sticking. How do you know it's sizzling and not boiling? How do you know it's sauteing? Listen to the sound. Actually, I don't need a pan anymore. It's sizzling. It's going sss. It's not going psh. If it looks like it has cloudy water around it, it's boiling. If you hear that sizzle, if the oil looks clear, that's how you know it's actually frying and actually developing the flavor that it needs to. Now we're actually sauteing these mushrooms, my friends. And now we can also, if you would like, do a little flip skis. There you go. That's what I'm talking about. Chef, what's your favorite mushroom? Godzilla's, it's gotta be the shiitake every single day of the week. I love shiitakes, they're cheap, you see them everywhere, and they're so juicy. Bumble, what am I cooking? Well, guess what? You could type an exclamation mark menu, but we're doing my take on a stroganoff. We sear it off a beautiful flank stick. We're topping it with some sumac onions. I walk through everybody how to properly actually saute mushrooms. We're not doing it the fake way. We did the wet cooking method. We went nice and slow and patient, my friends. Okay, and now it's sizzling away in a little bit of olive oil. The beef is seared, and again, as always, never in small pieces. We sear the steak whole, my beautiful flat iron steak. Also, welcome on in Bumble. How'd you find the cooking show? How'd you find the cooking stream? It's lovely to have you. I'm curious. I'm curious to know how people found out about this. Or if there's anybody who's new, who it's like the first time here, I would love to know how you guys ended up finding the show. And also, again, while we're at it, let's do a little bit of housekeeping. Everybody, if you'd like to support what we do here, exclamation mark Patreon is the best way to directly financially support the show, especially given the little uh, Twitch price increase on the sub. 
Uh, I think a lot less people are gonna be subscribing. My goal is to be able to do this full time one day. Okay. So keep it going, my friends. Look at those mushrooms. Now that's a sauteed mushroom. Look at that. You're here from Brahalla? Well, Jay Clausey, it's lovely to have you. I'm gonna be on for this weekend, by the way. I'm gonna be casting side stream. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna be on all, all weekend. So it'll be lovely to have you there. Okay, that is getting nice and browned. That's getting nice and beautiful. Okay, and at this stage is when we could add the onions. The onions will make the pan wet again. The onions will make the pan a little bit sticky. They're gonna release some of the sugars, but it's all gonna still work out. It's all gonna be nice and beautiful and sauteed. Look at this, beautiful. Toss it a few more times. It's getting nice and browned. And that, again, is the basis of the flavor for the stroganoff. Everybody, sizzling and frying things actually matters. If you were to boil everything, it wouldn't have the depth of flavor. Actually properly searing and sauteing your vegetables, that is what really, really makes a difference. And we're scraping up the bottom, and it's getting all really, really beautiful, and nothing is sticking to the pan because it was evenly heated all the way through. That is a proper cooked mushroom, I must say at this stage. So, I'm looking at the pan, and I know, look at the pan, it looks dry, doesn't it? If we add in the onions as it is, the onions can and will stick and burn. So we're going to need a little bit of extra fat. The mushrooms didn't really soak it up, but anytime you add food to fat, the fat will stick around the sides of it, okay? So the mushrooms didn't soak it up. They're not greasy on the inside. They just have the fat on the outside. So we're going to add in a little bit more oil, and then we will add in the onions. We're gonna add in the onions, season them with some salt, get those onions frying as well. Get them all in, get them in, get them in, get them in. Beautiful. Season this with some salt and we'll do the rest of our spices in a little bit. Salt goes on. Not too much because the rest of our ingredients are gonna be really, really salty. Okay? Mix them with themselves so that the mushrooms don't get too much of that excess salt and then we can mix everything in with each other. Now, I don't need super deep browning on my onions. Again, the only thing right now I really want to do is just to soften up the onions. I could probably turn on my fan again. Scrape up the bottom, my friends. And with the addition of the onions, remember, they will release some sugars as they cook. Medium heat at most. You never want to do your onions in a high heat unless it's a super quick stir fry. You will burn your onions in doing so. There you go. It's all coming along, everybody. It's all getting nice and beautiful. It's all getting nice and sauteed. Mmm. They're flavorful and delicious. Chef, olives are fruit, so olive oil is technically fruit juice. Well, most vegetables are fruits or flowers in some ways. In fact, everybody, vegetables, the idea of a vegetable, it's a purely culinary construct. Vegetables don't exist in nature. We just say vegetables are savory plants and fruits are sweet plants. Right? But there's plenty of plants that are sweet that aren't actually the fruits of a plant. Right? And then there's plenty of what we call vegetables that are fruits as well. So, uh, sure, call it whatever you want, really. Look at those mushrooms. Look at those onions. When I said we're actually sauteing, we're building real color. We're building real flavor. We're not just putting it in there for a few seconds. Okay, and that is so, 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 so important. I cannot emphasize to you enough about the importance of actually, you know, understanding what is going on when we do these things. Okay. So, I'm also going to go ahead and get some black pepper ground up. Um, in fact, I could probably just go directly inside of this. Let's get that black pepper in. I want this to be nice and properly seasoned. So we're gonna be really, really generous. How much black pepper? Until the voices tell you to stop. So I want a nice, generous amount of black pepper. Very, very rarely to have too much of black pepper in something, of course. And get that all nicely and beautifully mixed up. Mix it up, mix it up. As the onions cook, they get soft and sticky. They don't get to be uh, sauteed like this as easily. But at this stage, they can still be tossed a little bit. So distribute it, push and pull, my friends. Push and pull. This flips the ingredients. This doesn't just mix them around. Doing that push and pull motion, it actually flips them. If you do this, 
This isn't flipping anything. It's keeping all the vegetables on one side. But by doing the flipping motion, everything like this gets nicely flipped over onto its other side. Beautiful. The mushrooms are cooking. The onions are cooking. Everything looks, truthfully, pretty excellent at this stage. I want to try a mushroom just by itself. Everybody, what do you think? Is it snack time? Do I get a little mushroom as a treat? I want to hear the nice yasha, please and thank you. I'm going to try a little mushroom, see how it came out. Always snack time, that's right. Grab this bad boy. Mmm. Mmm. Seasoned. Juicy. Not at all in the slightest greasy or oily. It didn't soak any of it up. The flavor, it's like a piece of meat. Right? It is absolutely like a piece of meat. So, the order of operations matters. We don't add the spices in the beginning because the spices would burn. We don't add the garlic in the beginning because the garlic would burn. The order of operations for this stroganoff is as follows. Beef, remove beef. Mushrooms, onions, then garlic, then spices, then we deglaze with our wine, then we add the chicken stock. This is the actual order of operations that you need. Once you add the wet ingredients, the sauteing stage is done with. It is over, okay? So this looks wonderful. This looks perfect. At the moment, I'm gonna give this a few more minutes and then we'll go in with the wine. I'm gonna go get my bottle of wine opened. I'm using white wine, everybody. I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. Listen up. The kind of wine that you use doesn't really matter. It just doesn't. The only thing is like a port would be aggressively sweet. White wine and red wine, they aesthetically look different. You can use a cheap wine. The only thing I will say, I don't like cooking wines. Cooking wines have salt added to it so that it's not uh, actual, you know, you can't drink with it. Anything that is sold as a cooking wine, I would not get. Besides like a Shaoxing wine, but that's very, very different. We're talking about Western wines. We're talking about buying wine from a supermarket. Get a cheap bottle of red wine, right? As long as it's not too sweet, it's going to be perfect for most of your intentions with cooking. So that's all ready to go. That is just waiting for that to happen. Does anybody have any questions for me in the meantime? Well, you did say mushrooms are like meat that are like sponges, that's right. They're like even more sponge-like. They come in super saturated with water. Um, yeah, it's quite ironic, but again, when it comes to like Western wine, when it comes to Western cooking wine, uh, you don't, it's, I believe it's not like age restricted, right? Like you can just buy cooking wine because it has so much salt at it that you can't really drink it. But otherwise, yeah, you're never ever gonna be buying it. Unless you are, I guess, a minor. In which case, I don't know, dude, figure it out. <laughs> so. That is getting the, that's getting nice and close. Taste the black pepper, taste the salt. And now my friends, let's go in with my garlic. Sunny Peach Crush, welcome on in. It is lovely to have you. Let's go in with the garlic. Let's go ahead and add this bad boy on in. Because remember, if we add the garlic in any sooner, we would have risked burning it before the onions got done. So garlic goes in now. And now let's also properly saute the garlic. We want to infuse the oil with the garlic as well. Get it all in there and keep it moving. Keep it stirring until it's nice and fragrant to your heart's content. Then goes the spices, and then we do the deglazing with the wine. We'll add in the water plus some of the chicken bouillon. We'll add in some of the sauce components. And then we finish it with sour cream. We slice in the beef. We add the parsley. We make the pasta, the egg noodles rather. So keep it all stirring to make sure the garlic doesn't burn, but we still wanna be able to get some fry on the garlic. We want the garlic to fry up a little bit, okay? Beautiful. Excellent, even. Now that the garlic has been nicely fried, 
everybody in goes the spices that I talked about before, just the paprika and the cayenne. Again, we do this last while because it makes the pan sticky and they will absolutely scorch and burn if you add them sooner. So you add them in last before the wet ingredients go in. Add them sooner and your pan is just gonna become dry and cakey and all burnt. You can already see how it's just sticking to all of the food. Now, in goes the wine, everybody. It is time for us to reduce. Reduce, reduce, reduce. A nice, generous amount of white wine goes in. White wine or red wine, entirely up to you. And everybody, deglaze the stuck bits on the bottom, the stuck proteins, the stuck sugars. Get it all dissolved back into the wine. Get it all dissolved back into the liquid. And now, my stroganoff is stroganoff. Sorry, I'm not going to say that. I take that back. I apologize sincerely. Mix it up. Mix it up good. Get everything scraped back into the wine, my friends. Everything. Get the sides of the pan. Remember, we were sauteing it, we were tossing it. You have all the proteins, you have all the stuff stuck onto the sides. Everything needs to go back on in. And I mean everything. Do not sleep on the step, not even one bit. Mm. Delicious. The raw alcohol will eventually cook off. Already said this joke, it's forgiven. Thank you, Shai Chika. The Durham Guardian community has forgiven Durham Guardian TV. I can't help myself, okay? If we're making beef stro stroganoff, I almost called it something else. Look, okay? Also, by the way, there's a bit of a misconception. People associate this as like a very like Russian dish, that something that Russians eat at home. I didn't have stroganoff until I was like 13 years old. This is like the this is like a restaurant dish more than anything. It's pretty elaborate for a lot of Russian home cooks. Russian home food is a lot of stews, it's a lot of soups, it's a lot of boiled potatoes, it's a lot of cabbage. It's not as much stuff like this. This would be a little bit more of like a special occasion, or at least the way that I grew up having it. And everybody, look, the sauce is getting nice and viscous. You don't need flour. We don't need any additional starches. Trust me, with the power of the sour cream that we'll be adding later on, and through the reduction of the wine, and all of the fond, and everything else that we got going on, it will absolutely get nice and beautiful and thick. So, that has happened. Next, my salty ingredients. My soy sauce, my mustard, my uh, Worcestershire. All of that goes in now, okay? And we'll go in with a little bit of water, as well as my chicken bouillon powder. Okay, so it's going to get a little bit diluted now. It's going to get a little diluted at the stage. But right now, the goal is just to have enough for the chicken bouillon powder uh, to actually come into effect here. So in goes the water. And now we want to let the whole thing stew. We want to let it cook up. What is my lovely little chicken bouillon? I'm going to grab a spoon of that. If I had homemade chicken stock, that would be ideal for this. But alas, I don't really have any on hand. So in this goes. I love powdered chicken stock. I really, really do. It tastes like powdered chicken stock, but I am not upset about that at all. And we're not going to season this yet. We season the mushrooms, we season the beef, we've seasoned up all these different things. But the chicken bouillon powder and the soy sauce and the Worcestershire, all of them are quite salty. You can really, really easily risk over seasoning everything at this stage. Take it all and let's just mix it up. Let's mix it up. Let's mix it all up. I want a taste for salinity now. That will tell us how much we can actually get away with reducing it all. Make sure that the chicken bouillon is dissolved. Make sure that all of your different components are dissolved. And then we will inspect it. I have a feeling that I might have added a little too much tamale. A little too much of that soy sauce, right? Tamale is just gluten-free soy sauce, essentially. I keep spraying it on the floor. That is like the third time in a row that I have just done that. I'm gonna go ahead and just clean up after my mess. I do that so often in a kitchen. I am not the least messy chef alive. Give that a second for the chicken bouillon powder to dissolve, and then we will assess the salinity situation. If anything, we might need to remove some of the liquid, add in some plain water, and then go from there if it's too salty, which is a very real risk in my mind, at least at this stage. So let's give it a little taste. Delicious. 
flavorful. In my mind, that's a little salty, isn't it? I'm gonna let the uh, chicken bouillon powder dissolve a little bit longer, just in case I still had some leftover on my spoon. But I'm going to give that a little bit more time, just in case. So shoyu is the one that has more wheat. So, so you know, shoyu just means soy. Shoyu is just soy sauce. Shoyu, soya, soy, all of them basically the same thing. Tamari is the one that is gluten-free. Um, is it common in Russian restaurants or is it more like American pop Russian? No, it's common in Russian restaurants for sure. Every Russian restaurant will have stroganoff on the menu. Absolutely. Yeah, that much is true. This is like a bistro food, right? The word bistro came from Russian innately. And then also remember the sour cream is going to come in. The sour cream is going to be bland. But all I'm going to do right now is I'm going to just reduce this and see how much that affects the salinity with a little bit of cook time. My biggest fear was that I definitely added too much salt to the um, actual, like, uh, you know, in the form of the soy sauce itself. Happens, we'll be able to deal with it. We might need to be a little bit wasteful. And everybody, while we have a moment of time, this is when you put stuff away. Get these ingredients out of here, get stuff into the fridge, get stuff, uh, anything that you're not using anymore. This is called your passive time. And when you have some passive time, you use your passive time to clean. Okay, that is how you make sure that you are not left with a just big mess at the end of the day. All right, that's going, that's looking good. Let's have another little taste of our little concoction. See how that's coming along. Ooh, that is delicious. That's definitely a little salty. All right, I'm gonna have to make an executive decision, everybody. Actually, no, not yet. I still have some faith that a few things can dissolve, a few things can get a little better. I have faith. I have faith in the process. Greetings from Germany. Well, welcome on in. So everybody, we've basically done just about everything that we've needed to do. The onions are marinating in the fridge. The beef is seared, which we gotta just slice up. Last but not least, we're going to go ahead and slice the parsley, and then we're also going to go ahead and slice the beef. So, let's get that going. Everybody, it's not a beef stroganoff without some parsley, of course, at the end of the day. So, we're gonna go ahead and get a nice big mound of parsley. And I wanna add it all in. It's gonna go ahead and lighten everything up. It's gonna make everything nice and herbaceous. I'm gonna get the rest of the parsley back on into the fridge. And you see parsley be used everywhere in Russian cooking. I mean, absolutely everywhere. Russians love their parsley, and Russians also love their dill. Okay, so no dill in this case, just parsley. Although dill in a beef stroganoff is not all that traditional, I'm sure it would still be, with confidence, pretty excellent nonetheless. So cooking all this stuff down, cooking it all down. And let's go ahead and pluck the parsley. Sure, a lot of vitamin C, yeah, but also a lot of produce does. So here's the thing about vitamins though. A lot of people, they like to think about like vitamins and like, oh, this is good for me because it has this. Generally speaking, with a decently balanced diet, you will get all the different vitamins that you need unless you have some sort of an absorption issue or something actually medically diagnosed. Vitamins are very much so like a commercialized selling point rather than actually something rooted in genuine health benefits is my problem with like sort of like really acknowledging the vitamin content or the nutritional content of something. Um, really the answer is ultimately if you're eating fresh produce, chances are you will be able to get enough of all the different micronutrients uh, that you need to sustain yourself, right? Unless you have an actual like diagnosed issue in terms of absorption or something else. But generally speaking, everybody through food, you will be able to get just about everything that you actually need. But also I'm okay with, with maybe my sauce being a little bit salty because I have a big old thick piece of beef. I'm gonna have sour cream going into the equation as well soon. So, you know, I think we can figure things out. It's not gonna get less salty as it cooks, but it's more like things are gonna dissolve into each other and it's become a little bit even in case there was any pockets of salt that we were getting a hold of. So, plucking off all of my parsley leaves. Gonna keep it plucking, gonna keep it plucking. Keep it all plucking, keep it plucking, keep it plucking. 
because I don't want any of those stems. They're a little bit too fibrous. Soon with Elon's Neuralink, we'll be able to smell and taste Twitch streamers. The cooking and not them. Well, all right. Okay. That thought ends there, I suppose. Um, okay, let's go back in. Let's just stir this up to make sure nothing is sticking, to make sure that nothing is burning on the bottom of the pan right now. Everything is getting nice and delicious, my friends. Okay, and let's go ahead and bundle all of this stuff up. Let's bundle it up, let's bundle it up. Let's bundle it up, my friends. And we're gonna go ahead and get a nice slice. Remember, we never chop herbs. We only go in with a nice little slice and slice it and slice it and slice it. Never chop, never crush it. Thin, thin, thin slice all the way through. If anybody has any questions, now would be an excellent time to go ahead and ask. I'm gonna be heating up some water after we do the parsley, for the pasta, for the egg noodles rather. And we're going to go back through. This parsley is going to get mixed in. Some of it we might just use as a garnish as well. There you go. Nicely sliced. Ready to go. And I'm going to get my water boiling for my egg noodles. How many can this recipe serve? This is about a one and a half ch uh, pound chunk of beef. I'm gonna say at minimum, probably four portions. Now, also, Sunny Peach Crush, this isn't a recipe. This is all technique, right? But I know, not to be like a semantic Samuel about it, actually. Uh, I, I just don't really like calling the things that I do recipes. So, slice that parsley up. It doesn't need to be much finer than that. And I'm gonna go ahead and just section that off. Put that over here. What if you're hungry? I think this is going to make more than enough portions. Everybody, I don't think uh, that that's going to be a problem at all. All right. I think I put my bench scraper already into the dishwasher. Oh, no, never mind. I lied. Grab that. Put that onto my little plate. This is going to be used for later. My water should now be coming up to a boil through my egg noodles. Lovely. So let's go back to this. Let's go check on this bad boy. It's simmering, it's stewing along, the onions are dissolving inside, everything is getting nice and flavorful. Right, you can see that the sauce is definitely like beginning to like thicken up and reduce here, but the question is, is this too salty? And the answer is gonna be yeah, absolutely it will be. But let's taste it one more time, just to be sure, just to be confident. You know what? Oh, that's salty, uh-huh, I lied, okay. Out this goes into a little separate bowl. We're gonna take out some of the liquid. We're gonna replace it with a little bit of water. Yeah, we're gonna lose some viscosity, but ultimately I just want a good eating experience, right? So a little bit tragic that we have to do this. I ended up being a little bit too generous, but there is really no way to remove salt. You can only either dilute something or remove um, some of the existing liquid. And so I'm gonna take out two ladlefuls of this and we can always add it back in if we feel like it needs more. So a little bit sad because we work to build up all of this lovely flavor. I'm a little sad to be doing this, but ultimately this is for the best. I do not want a dish too salty. It will absolutely ruin the entirety of the dish. Let's add in the water and let's see what kind of an impact that has made for the salinity. It's still gonna get nice and thick. Has anyone cataloged all the cool t-shirt chef is working on stream? I don't think anybody's explicitly cataloged it, Puse. That sounds cool. Okay, we've taken some of it out. We put some more water back on in. And all we're really doing is we're cooking the onions down so that they're contributing the sweetness into the sauce. Let's go ahead and taste it again. Yeah, we lose some viscosity. It's going to be a little bit runnier than I would like. But salinity wise, so much better. Yeah, we lost some depth. We lost a little bit of depth of flavor, but that is what the cooking is about. Sometimes you have to make some last minute adjustments, right? A little bit unfortunate, a little bit tragic, but that's how the cookie crumbles, my friends. So, onions are done. 
Water is boiling through the egg noodles. The beef has been sealed. But now we have to slice the beef, my friends. The beef is gonna be raw on the inside because do not forget, the beef is gonna finish cooking inside of the sauce. Now is gonna be the time that we cut it all into strips. Is everybody still watching? I wanna hear another Yash Chef, please, and thank you. Yeah, Chef, wonderful. That sauce is cooking. It's cooking down. Let's go grab the beef. And now, this is where it becomes really, really important to know what we're doing. Everybody, this is a flat iron steak. This steak can become tough and chewy if you don't know what you're doing. So, we need to find the grain of the beef itself. We need to look where the muscle fibers are traveling on this piece of beef. And they're going in this way. Think about it, cut parallel to the muscle fibers. You'll get a lot of really, really long, thick strands and it'll be super tough and basically inedible. You want a bunch of really, really, really short strands of beef essentially. So, going back in, taking a look, I think I see the grain of the muscle fibers. I see them going in that way. So here's what we're going to do. First, I'm just gonna go ahead and cut this beef in half or so. Um, doesn't really matter how I cut it in half, truth be told. Any which way. Or we can always just cut into pieces after. But I just really wanna make sure that my fibers are correct. And I do believe my fibers are correct. Okay, everybody, we're gonna be going for not too thin, but not too thick slices. Too thin, and then you're just gonna get big sheets of beef inside of it. It's gonna be raw inside, and that is totally okay. Although, even if it is raw, guess what? I don't care, that's totally fine for me. Mm. Beautiful, really delicious. We're cutting perpendicular to the grain, my friends perpendicular and at an angle. We're going to get a bunch of really, really short muscle fibers that way. Okay, so not too thin, not too thick. We're gonna cut it like this first and then we'll cut it into some smaller pieces. Carpaccio stroganoff, oh yeah. It's okay for it to be raw inside. It's supposed to be raw inside at this stage, my friends. It's gonna finish cooking in the sauce. Do not worry. Do not fret. We could probably try to cut out this connective tissue here, honestly, because we've already like opened up the slices. That'll help to make the meat a little bit more tender. Can I solve a Rubik's cube? Nope, and I don't have a plan on it. Slice it up, slice it up, all that beautiful beef. It's cold inside, it's raw inside, and that is totally okay. I can promise you that. So. All we want to go ahead and do now is cut this into some little pieces. So we have these strips right here. I can probably cut this chunk in half like so. And we're just going to cut them down lengthwise, just like this for each of them. Welcome on in, Pseudo Natural. It's lovely to have you. Hope you're having an excellent day today. Let's get that meat nice and sliced up. Nice and sliced. Get it all in. Beautiful. Can't lie, would eat it like that? Oh, trash can cop mom. Me too, truthfully. That is how I like my meat. I like it basically raw in the middle. Although a flat iron, I feel like doesn't really benefit from being that really, really little cooked. So I know it was raw, that's okay. Trust me, it's all gonna get finished. It's all gonna follow through. You all need to have a little bit of faith. You all need to have a little bit of patience. Okay, so sauce, let's taste this again, right? It's been stewing, the onions have cooked down, some more of the water has ended up reducing in the process as well. And then if anything, we can always dilute this with a little bit of additional liquid. So let's have a little taste. Where's my spoon? There it is. Let's taste that liquid. Let's taste that sauce, my friends. Mm. Not too salty. That is perfect. Okay? Everybody, we are going to begin 
finishing the Shogun off. San Pablo, welcome on in. It is lovely to have you. That is way too odd. I'll be cutting my foot off before I get to 60. And so what? And I will live with it. That'll be totally fine by me. Everybody, lower the heat. We don't want to boil this beef to death. Just enough to get it cooked through. It's going to have enough carryover cooking, I promise. Get the beef inside. Next, so important. We are going to do something called tempering. Everybody, we're going to take some of this liquid. We're going to take some of this liquid. We're not going to just put sour cream directly inside. If we put sour cream directly inside, it's going to split, it's going to curdle into a bunch of little pieces. And that is not what I am looking for. Take this liquid, take this liquid, okay? Take it, set it aside. Take it, set it aside, okay? Take some of this liquid, set it aside. It's okay if there's a few chunks in there of some other stuff, okay? Take it and set it aside. Next. We go in with the sour cream into the bowl and not into the beef directly. I'm gonna say this again. Do not put the sour cream directly inside of the beef. If you do so, you're going to end up with a split and curdled mess. Take it and mix it. Mix it, mix it, mix it, mix it, mix it. And this is called tempering, my friends. If the heat is too high, the sour cream will curdle. It'll split. It will not be beautiful and creamy and delicious. We need to temper the sour cream, my friends. Let's get all of my leftover sour cream, all of it mixed up. I'm gonna mix in the beef with the rest of the sauce. Just make sure that everything is nicely and beautifully and evenly cooking up. There you go, there she goes. It's all gonna cook through, my friends. Just give it some faith, give it a little bit of time. Speaking of which, I did forget to put in the time sooner. The time should have been actually added a lot sooner than now, but that's okay. So, guess a shitty pun has helped me to remember what I needed to do. That is an aggressive amount of beef. That is a disproportionately large amount of beef at that. I'm adding in all of my sour cream. Again, the whole point of today, I had excess sour cream and I wanted to use it up before it goes bad. Mix it up, mix it up, mix it up, mix it up. Mix it separately. And then we add it just at the end with all of the parsley. I'm gonna be throwing away my tub of sour cream. That was one of my goals for today, to use that all up. And guess what? We have done so successfully. We're going to go ahead and just mix the beef around, my friends. Make sure that it's all cooking. Make sure that it's all doing what it needs to do. There you go. That beef is all coming together. The beef is almost done on the inside. It's almost exactly where it needs to be. Chef, your salad making advice has helped me get a second chance with my partner after we broke up. Thanks. Sunny Peach Crush, I'm happy to help. I'm happy. <laughs> I'm happy to contribute. Ugh. Keep it all going, my friends. Just keep mixing it so that the beef does not cook unevenly. And I still want it to be nice and medium rare. I don't want it to be completely and totally cooked to death. Now, lower the heat to the lowest possible temperature. So important. You do not want your heat to be high. You don't want your sauce to be boiling. You don't want it to be bubbling and viscous. Everybody, get that sour cream in there now. Get it in, get it inside, get it inside. Get it all inside. And now we mix it all in. Low heat everybody so that it doesn't curdle. Your sour cream can and will curdle if your heat is too high, but it's not curdling. Look at how it's melting. Look at how it is actually properly and beautifully infusing into the sauce itself. It is not curdling. It is not splitting. It is just becoming nice and velvety and rich. That is a really, really beautiful stroganoff. And now we're going to use almost all of our parsley. All of it, almost all of it. We're gonna save some for garnish. All that goes in. Okay, and mix it up one last time. 
and we tasted food seasonings, but I already know that this bad boy is gonna be perfect. That is my beef and mushroom stroganoff, my friends. There she is. She is all done. She's all ready to go. The beef is gonna finish cooking through with carryover heat. We're gonna take this off the heat. We're gonna turn this off, but I can't help but feel like I still want a little taste. So I think we're gonna have a little taste of just the sauce. How did the sauce come out, my friends? It's fucking perfect. It's creamy. Mm. It's rich. It's delicious. It's everything you wanted it to be and more. That is my stroganoff. Finish with sour cream, perfectly creamy. Let's go cook the noodles and then we'll clean up while that's happening. There she is. Let's switch the heat. Here we go. Now, the pasta itself doesn't need to be too seasoned. It'll be perfect anyways. Luna Echoes, welcome on in. How's the salt level, chef? Sunny peach crust, it's exactly where it needs to be. It is perfect. A little bit of salt. We don't need the noodles to be too seasoned. And let's go in with the egg noodles. You can use any pasta. You can do potatoes. You can do rice. You can do anything that you would like for this. But I'm using egg noodles because we had some leftover egg noodles from something or the other. Adding a bunch of those in. As it is. And everybody, to stop them from sticking, just mix it. All you gotta do is just mix it in. Just mix it and then stir it every so often. And then it won't stick to itself. It's not gonna clump up. All you needed to do was just mix it the whole time. Just mix it, just let it do its own thing. Now, I'm gonna take a second to clean up. I'm gonna take a second to put a few things away and we are going to get ready for tonight's dinner. Okay, I'm gonna put away all the different dirty dishes while the pasta, while the noodles are cooking. And I'm using pasta and noodles interchangeably here. Putting away a few things, taking advantage of my time now to be able to go ahead and clean everything up, get all the stuff out of here. Some people like to garnish their stroganoff with some more sour cream on top. I don't have any more sour cream on top. If you do, well, go ahead and be my guest and add it on in. But in my case today, that will not be happening. So I'm taking all of my stuff, all of my dirty dishes, all of it's gonna get, go ahead and get put into the dishwasher. Oh. How are we doing everybody? We doing good, we're hanging in there. It's good to see all of you. I missed you all so much. Look, I'm so happy that the cooking streams are like back and in full force once again. And you could do this al dente. You don't have to do this al dente if you don't want. It's stroganoff at the end of the day. Russians overcook their pasta to death. In fact, it would be more traditional if you overcooked your pasta too. I know like my grandma and my mom, they hate like having like what they consider raw pasta. I find it to be so funny every single time. Like the way that I like to eat mine is considered completely unacceptable uh, to them. So cook it to your heart's content is all I'm just trying to say. The cooking streams are fire very enjoyable. Well, I'm glad to provide in that case. I'm just gonna create a little bit of space for us. I'm gonna put away my butcher block. I, can, I probably have the time to wash up my knife. The only thing that we're gonna do now is to check the doneness of the pasta. And how do we check? We just taste it. We pick up a little noodle and we see how far along it's actually come. Yep. It just needs just about one more minute and then it'll be perfect and it'll be all set to just drain out. I'll get some butter out for it so we can toss it with some butter. I'll get the sumac onions out. And everybody, we are just about done. We have so little cooking left to actually do today. I'm really excited about today's food. I'm really, really excited about it. I don't know what inspired me to do the sumac onions other than the red onion that I had on my fridge, but I was like, yeah, that's gonna go great with this. Speaking of which, we could probably just check on it. See how that's doing. Come in, let's taste these onions. They've been marinating with the parsley, with the sumac, with the lime. How's that taste? Exactly how I envisioned it. That is delicious. 
Mm. That is so yummy. That is so perfect. That is exactly what I need it to be. It does exactly what I need it to do. I think my egg noodles are all cooked at this stage. I'm gonna taste them one more time. Mm. A little bit more. And then it'll be perfect. We'll mix in some butter. We'll be all set. I'll get a bowl out. Let's get my strainer out, my little colander. And all I'm doing is I'm just getting ready to be able to dump in the pasta because it is just about to come out. It is just about done cooking. We're not gonna do any emulsification. There's not gonna be any pasta water involved. None of that nonsense. It's just gonna be some noodles served with some stroganoff. So, let's taste the doneness one last time. Mm hmm That's good. That's perfect. I'm killing the heat, and I'm straining it out. Pasta has been strained. Let's add it right back on in. I lost one of them in the process, but that's okay. And we'll just go in with a little bit of butter and then we will be perfect. Chef, what has to be the warmest when serving the starch with the protein? The starch, I think absolutely. The starch cools down really, really fast. Or rather, I don't know, both of them are important. So it's kind of difficult to say. And all that we're gonna do everybody is just get, I have this little chunk of butter it's about a tablespoon or two of butter. All of that goes in because it's time for buttered noodles. My ancestors cry, see bad Russian, you food. What do you mean, my ancestors cry? I'm Russian, I have more of a claim, and I'm quite good at what I do. Is this bad Russian food? Not at all. All right. Let's get that butter, let's get it all mixed in. You don't want the butter fully melted. You want it to just be uh, intact enough that it holds on still to the noodles themselves. So like really, really make sure to take it off the heat when you do this and really mix it in. And now, that is a plain buttered noodle. And that is wonderful. A little bit of salt. So, everybody, it's time. Privet, privet tibet toujours. It's time for us to plate. We have finished everything that we needed to go ahead and do today. So let's go ahead and get everything plated up. Let's get it all done. Let's get it all into our lovely bowl. We're going to start with a nice generous helping of my noodles right inside. I'm a hungry boy right now, I gotta say. Let's go in with a nice healthy helping of my beef. Let's get some of the beef, and then of course that luxurious sauce. Which, I didn't have as much sauce as I would have liked to usually end up with for something like this, but I think that's okay. For today at least, that'll be all right. No reason to complain about having too much beef. Okay, there you go. And now, my friends, last but not least, let's head over to, head over to the stroganoff. Let's go ahead and top it off with some of those onions, just because we have some. Just because we have them, we have them ready to go. I wanna go ahead and get some onions in there. My delicious sumac onions. Right on top. And everybody, I believe that's it. I think that's my stroganoff. I think that we're all done for today. We've done everything that we needed to. I'm gonna see if I can get a decent photo of this, but I don't know if I can. It's a little dark in my kitchen at the moment. Mmm. But 
that's my stroganoff. Really simple, some boiled noodles, red onions that we marinated with some sumac, some parsley, some lime, okay, a little bit of salt. And then everybody, my beautiful beef. We seared the beef, we sauteed mushrooms, we sauteed onions, we added Worcestershire, we added soy sauce, we added paprika, cayenne, mustard. Finish it with tempered sour cream, a little bit of chicken stock. Let's go ahead and have some of the pasta with that sauce. Mm. Let's have some of the beef. Mm. Mm. That is so tender. That beef is so delicious. Mm. Oh, the noodles are so comforting. You know that onion on top? Oh yeah. Sunny peach kush, both. My mom's side is Russian, my dad's side is Ukrainian. But functionally, both like Russian parentheses USSR. Mm. Mm. Yeah. That's good. That is lovely. Everybody, thank you all for watching. Thank you all for being here. This was a lot of work. We made a delicious stroganoff every Wednesday, every Friday, every Sunday we live. I'm gonna see you all in two days time. If you haven't done so, please try to support the Patreon if you can. The Patreon is the best way to directly financially support the show. My goal is to be able to do this full time one day. Any and all support on the Patreon would go a really, really long way. Every Wednesday, Friday and Sunday, this is our third stream back in a new kitchen. It was amazing to see all of you again. Hope you all have a good night. Good luck with the rest of the week. I'm gonna see you all on Friday. We're gonna make something delicious as usual. Hope you all have a good night. See you later, bye-bye.